there is in the hard copy of the table papers. And this means that the general public will not be permitted to access the building and to public galleries in the chamber or committees. And subject to the usual procedures in relation to closed sessions, any public sessions of the committee will continue to be broadcast live for the public to view. While this is not ideal, of course, um, the Assembly and the, the Assembly Commission and the Speaker has taken this decision in the interest of public safety and procedures will continue to be reviewed on a daily basis. Um, members will know through correspondence that we have a very much a revised agenda for today's meeting. Um, the skills strategy briefing has been rescheduled and the committee has pulled out of the concurrent meeting with the Education Committee on the 14 to 19 strategy. Sure, sorry, Chair, it's now been stood down. They're not receiving a briefing at all now. So. And thanks, Peter. Um, sorry, so today, instead, we, we felt it was um, of utmost importance to hear from both the department and the hospitality and tourism in industry on the impact of um, COVID-19. And I'm sure members like myself will be very aware of a number of businesses who have um, closed over the past couple of days and um, people who have been laid off. And I think um, we are, we're very conscious of that in our discussions today. Um, so the closed stage, uh, we will also have a closed session with departmental officials um, getting an update on our HA following the publish of the inquiry last week. So if members are content with the revised agenda? Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so members are also aware from email correspondence that due to the ongoing COVID-19 situation, the Chair and the Deputy Chair um, have agreed that the committee's visit to McGee, which was due to take place next week, will be postponed. And we have also um, pulled out of the Joint Committee visit to Larnport and delayed the meeting with um, Access Employment Limited, which was due to take place on the 22nd of April. Um, are the Infrastructure Committee still... We have yet to hear back from them on what they're going to do. Okay. And the energy event that we have um, planned for the 29th of April has been um, rescheduled for a later date. I don't think we have that date as no, yet because still... we're waiting to mm -hmm. see that's how things develop. Future. So are members content with these changes to the immediate forward work programme? Yeah. Okay, so due to the late and substantive changes to the agenda, members should refer to the printed agenda which is um, <coughs> provided for them in order to follow today's procedures. And um, I will, of course, direct members to the, the correct page numbers. So they will also see there's a number of items in, tabled in hard copy for members. So moving on then to item number one, which is our apologies. We have apologies uh, um, from, from Stuart, um, the long-standing apology, and also from Gary Middleton today. Um, and everybody else is here. So. Um, number two then, draft minutes. It's on page five of your original pack. Are members content that they are a reflection of the meeting? Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then moving on to three, um, there is a, a letter which I received from the CEO of Boston and Coach NI Limited um, on the impact of COVID-19 on the coach industry. It's in um, hard copy papers. That's in the sheaf that opens with the uh, speaker's letter. So are members content that I would seek agreement from the, the author of the letter to forward it to the minister? Agreed. Yep. Agreed. Thank you. Okay, so item number four then, we'll have a departmental briefing on the impact of um, COVID-19. So first of all, we are going to hear from the department officials. Yeah. Um, we have um, Shane Murphy, who's Director of Analytical Services Division, and Keith Foster, who's Director of Strategic Policy Division. Um, welcome to our meeting this morning, and if you just want to give us an initial briefing, and then we'll open it up to members. Okay, I'll kick off with the uh, initial briefing. Um, I'll start off with the, 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 the general picture um, before I hand over to Keith. And then, obviously, um, Donal and John will come along and drill down further into the, some of the sectoral and business impacts that are, are being observed on the ground. Um, obviously, this is an economy setting. You know, I think we, we, like others, would recognise this is a, a public health issue, first and foremost. And, um, nothing that we might say today, given we're very passionate about the economy and so forth, should 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 detract that. But it is a uh, an emergency that's going to have impacts for all sorts of aspects of our lives, and that includes the economy too. And uh, it looks like we're we're heading for um, a big 
hopefully temporary shock to the to the economy. Um, a lot of that is going to depend on sort of the the pathway of the public health crisis and how long things last for. Um, and obviously, I'm not in any way competent to 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 project on on that front. But given what we know and hear to date, it, it, it's it looks like that economic shock could be could be very large, and both a demand shock and a supply shock at, at, at the same time. So disruption to economic life is, 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 is going to be highly significant. Those impacts are already with us and have been for, for, for some time. They're most evident and in the sort of tourism, travel and hospitality sector, and I know John will expand on all of that, but we, we have been seeing that for, for a period of time. But those effects have been coming through and are being felt also in other industries, and if they're not, they soon will be. And um, I suppose Dole will probably say, from Invest and I, will 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 we'll say more about that and what 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 his folks are are seeing on the ground. Um, across the economies and, and the world, um, we're seeing projections for growth being revised down. Quite frankly, there's probably a lot of economists out there wondering how on earth. Do you do you do you try and scope something like they've never had to scope before because they're not health experts? You know, I think I used the phrase before. You, you, I know where you need a, a public health crystal ball and your economic forecasting crystal ball, and I doubt if, any, if anyone's been either of, of those. I think it's very telling if you look over the last week or so. I've probably lost count of the number of uh, countries. Announcing emergency fiscal stimulus packages. Um, now, that in itself is pretty telling. You know, we've effectively had two st stimulus packages announced by the Chancellor in less le less than a week. One that was, you know, there you couldn't even hide that it was tagged onto the budget. Mm -hmm. And then one, obviously, um, last night when we were, like, probably some of us were tuned in at five o'clock or so to, to hear what was. Was announced. Um, it's looking highly likely that the sort of growth forecast pre-coronavirus for, for the year that's that's probably wiped out. That's gone. There's, the question is, to what extent will things be be worse than that? I think that's probably the reasonable reasonable expectation. You know, speaking personally, I think if you offered the Chancellor a mild recession, he'd probably to hand of you. Um, you know, there are simultaneous demand and supply sh shocks across in, occurring across the, the globe, and it's really not terribly difficult to envisage some scenarios where you have very significant negative growth for, for, for this year. Um, we have been looking at the early impacts in the economy at a macro level and the impacts at a sector level. Those papers as of Monday, and I appreciate they may even be out of date since Monday, um, but th th those have been shared with the committee and were, 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 were shared with a, a executive ministers. And um, Keith will, 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 will talk a, a, a bit more a, after me on some of the potential um, areas for, for, for priorities and action. Um, emphasize that this is a really fast moving situation. And as I said, Monday's papers are probably out of date. You know, again, I'm not a, in any way a, 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 a health expert, or, uh, but there seemed to be a, very much a, a change in um, approach announced on, on Monday. And um, that approach and the sort of timescales of how things might pan out, that alone probably warrants a, some sort of update. Um, but nevertheless, it's useful to do this sort of analysis in that uh, it's important to understand the issues and help sort of frame uh, an economic response, but keeping in mind the, what's probably a 
a likelihood that things will change and things will, 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 will need to adapt. Um, in terms of <coughs> sectoral assessments, again, Donal and John will go into the examples <coughs> what, of, of what they uh, have seen. Um, the, the, the folks from the sort of um, hospitality side of things will, will, will not have any good news for you. Uh, I'm afraid. Um, but there's three ways that this is impacting in the main. Um, one is supply chains, and that's disruption to supply chains, uh, including both, uh, I, I would include sort of import and export in this, even though in theory export is, 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 is demand related. Um, uh, but you will have companies getting difficulty getting components. We now have um, you know, a lot of air restrictions, so it's difficult for people to move about. So that will have impact for, 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 for linkages that are required for people movement, including impacts on services. Um, and we, we published a paper um, along with NISWA a few months ago, which, which, which talked about the interdependencies of Northern Ireland's imports and exports, the proportion of those that were intermediate goods. So when world trade sort of um, starts to um, encounter problems and issues, that, that has potential on both the import and the export side for, for, for different types of difficulties. The second one is, is customer demand. And that's, that, that's the one that is really observable and has become much more apparent within the, the last fortnight. The contraction in air traffic movements, the impacts in tourism, the cancellation of, of all sorts of public events, and that you'll have also seen a, um, a well to what extent to which it's seen or to what extent to which it's 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 it's, it's occurred. But it looks to me that it's, it's already occurring is 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 the fall away in footfall. Um, you know, I probably only had a drive in this morning to. You know, to, to 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 see that, and uh, to be honest, we, we do see it in some of the some of the data that we're 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 monitoring. For some, for example, some of the road traffic data is 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 is, is well down. Labour impacts, um, and this is where the supply side shock is 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 it's probably set to occur more so than being observed ob observed to date, um, and this is as. Um, workers get sick, have to take action to to follow the public health messages, and so forth. Or, or as you know, there is also potential fears as well, which may impact on, on people's preparedness to to undertake what they may feel is now not an absolute necess necessity. Um, the re research um, also points to that sort of. The pathway of schools will have an impact on, on, on the labour supply, and that, uh, the, the, the research there suggests that, that's, that that could be quite impactful um, for the overall outcome. So, in terms of labour impact, that's probably one where we see one of the biggest impacts, and probably one of the biggest impacts that's yet to come. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of touching on some of the things to date, uh, so I'll not tread on what John might say and uh, what, uh, for example, Joanne might say later on, but you know, tourism, travel, hospitality, those types of industries have been hit first and hit very hard and a big, big fall off in, in, in demand in major tourist attractions, hotels and restaurants and, and, and airline travel. I'll not go into the to the examples, because those guys will have a bang up to date set of examples. As I said, it, it won't make for, for, for pretty reading any of this. Retail also, we, we believe, is feeling the pinch. Now, obviously, probably setting aside panic buying. Um, there are signs that footfall is down in, in data. We, we hope to get some more up, 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 up to date data. But um, we strongly think that the parts of retail will be feeling the impact. I don't know, uh, for example, in clothing retailers and so forth, you know, if there ain't going to be, if there's going to be concerns about whether there's going to be any summer holidays, you, you might not be buying that Hawaiian shirt or whatever it might be. 
Um, or you might be leaving it back if you did buy it. Um, <laughs> People post it back, of course, isn't it? Mm, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it's true. That, that is a different system um, <laughs> again. Um, what I would say, uh, without going into the sort of the detail that, that, that John will talk about, the tourism, travel and hospitality, this isn't good news either. What we've seen in tourism, travel and hospitality, unfortunately, that is actually consistent with the sorts of impacts you'd expect at the containment phase. OK, we've we're out of the containment phase a few days, but most of the observed impacts are over that period. And what we've seen, as I said, is, is consistent. Those are impacts on travel, footfall, on things where people might ordinarily come together. Um, the delay phase is set, to, is set, what we're in now, is set to see those impacts spread and escalate, <coughs> and they will spread to lots of other sectors. Um, the impact we suspect from that will be much bigger and probably fair to say that it's hard to think of too many sectors that will, will, will escape that. So I was going to hand over to Keith to see if he wanted to say anything, but uh, I could take questions now or take questions Maybe afterwards. we hear from, from Keith and then we can take questions for both. Okay. Uh, I think just to outline, first of all, I mean, I appreciate this. This is a fluid and fast-moving situation. Um, Time is of the essence. Um, actions um, need to be taken, in our view, as a matter of urgency. As Shane rightly said, we can't underestimate the impact that this is going to have on the economy. It's huge. There's been nothing like this in recent times. Um, we're getting hit from three angles, um, demand, supply, and the labour force itself. And the impact of that is it's not good. So, so where are we? Um, the executive on Monday night announced that it was going to be bringing forward a package of measures to try and mitigate against the worst effects. These measures were aimed at protecting the most vulnerable, and proposals so far include rates relief for businesses, continuing free school meals if schools close, and support for, for the elderly and the homeless. Last night, the UK government announced a further set of financial measures. Um, this includes 330 billion of guarantees to be made available, um, which is equivalent to 15% of, of GDP. And indications are there's going to be more to come, and there could be things specifically put in place for the airlines and the aviation industry and specific programmes of sectoral support. Um, so, the some of the key initiatives set out um, as part of the Chancellor's statement include extending the business uh, interruption loan scheme, a potential support package for airlines and air airports, as I just mentioned, business rates holiday, cash grants, mortgage holidays, um, and a commitment to reimburse small and medium-sized uh, companies for the cost of statutory sick pay. As part of that, uh, the Chancellor announced that the devolved administrations will receive at least $3.5 billion in additional funding, which will support businesses here, Scotland and Wales. The Department has been working with executive colleagues to develop a package of measures as best we can and using all the means at our disposal. So to date, we have considered possible mitigations in two ways. Firstly, we're working with the Department of Finance to assess the extent to which the announcement in the budget yesterday will um, translate to the budgetary position here locally. Secondly, we are trying to identify any gaps um, where some of the policies that were announced could be England only, and how do we translate the equivalent packages of support locally here so that our businesses are not put at a disadvantage. Um, I suppose, really, possible mitigations are being considered around the broad areas. Um, business survival is the first thing. What is actually required now? Um, business continuity, what needs to be implemented in the very short term? And, I, and then we're going to need to look at business recovery. I mean, this is where we're at. How, how do we help businesses through this? So a lot of this is going to be dependent on how the crisis unfolds and develops. Um, I'll finish there because I know there's going to be questions, <coughs> but I would just say we don't have the answers now, but you know, we are working to have those answers in a, in a very, very short period of time. Okay, well, thank you very much um, for 
for your presentation and outlining what is, is very stark and I, when I'm sure we were all aware it was going to be stark. Um, there obviously we have heard a number of announcements over just the course I suppose of the last 24 hours in terms of the, the stimulus package. Um, the, the cash grants and I, I heard this the finance minister on, on this morning. Um, have we any further clarity in relation to, to those as yet in terms of if businesses here are able to, to access those? Truthfully there's a there's a uh, there's work required to actually bottom this out. Um, there is the some of the Bank of England um, initiatives that have been announced will directly link into the offering that the banks have here um, through some of the guarantee schemes and the business interruption loan. However, the direct cash to businesses by way of grant, um, I suspect, would be something that we would look to have to put in place ourselves here, um, an equivalent scheme. Okay, because uh, like I, I listened to the finance minister and he, he says that they were working with Treasury to, to work that out and that they were hopeful that that actually would be put in place by Treasury? They, they could well be, Chair. Okay. I, I, think, I think we need we need clarity in that. I think we could be reasonably comf comfortable that the, 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 the stuff around the, the business interruption loan scheme and so forth will, will, will apply across the board. Um, um, I, I, I suspect uh, DOF officials will need clarity as to um, whether the Treasury expect to apply the, 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 the £25,000 loans ac ac across the board. Uh, I used to work years ago in, 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 in DOF, um, so uh, I, I think that's, a, that, that's certainly one that I, that I put a question mark aside as to whether it's across the board or whether yep. uh, w w we will have to do something to make it happen in terms of equivalence over here. And just in relation to, to I suppose, all of this, have we time frames? Because all of us, I'm sure, are being, being contacted by businesses on a daily basis. And for many of them, it's their concern about their staff as much as anything else. Um, and I think that there, I think there's a real sense of urgency to, to get some cash out to some of these businesses absolutely as quickly as possible. So even in terms of administration of the likes of the grants or loans, are we looking to expedite that in any way? And well, obviously, um, we, we do have vehicles to deliver things. What exactly those things are, we, we obviously have Tourism and I, we obviously have Invest and I, which are vehicles to deliver money to businesses. Um, uh, so we, we cert we're not without infrastructure to deliver things. Um, the, the question will be on the, the sort of the precise detail around that and uh, the, 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 again we would be looking to our, our, our sort of our, our delivery bodies to be able to respond to, to make those things happen. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate this this may be speed that you know their things weren't necessarily designed to deliver in, in normal times um, and uh, I, I, I think we, 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 we recognize this isn't a normal situation and you know uh, it's probably going to be uncomfortable to, to, to do things with public money at a speed which we normally would, would never do, particularly in light of having a report last week. Thank you. Christopher. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions. In terms of the, the 25k grant scheme that was announced at GB last night by the Chancellor for retail, leisure and hospitality sectors, how do you envisage, and the Chair touched on this, how do you envisage a, a Northern Ireland scheme operating and looking? And I appreciate what you've said about <clears throat> having to move with haste and that being an uncomfortable uh, thing, but obviously it's necessary. And I'm just wondering if you could flesh out for us how you see us delivering that here in Northern Ireland. Well, uh, again, A, we don't know how it's been delivered in. In, in England, if it is an England only scheme, if it's a, a scheme that is um, going to be available to all, that's you know, there. I, I suppose that would be one less task that we have to do in, in, yeah. in the midst of many tasks that we, we have to do. Uh, you know, there. I strongly suspect that um, we, we, we would look to see what, what sort of equivalent powers and systems we have within Invest and I and Tourism and I, and whether there there are ready-made vehicles to do this, and legislative powers and so forth, or if something can be in some way adapted. Yeah. It, it's 
using stuff that already exists is probably going to deliver something quicker than inventing something new. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, an issue around workers' rights, um, I'll give you an example. My wife works 16 hours a week in uh, B&M on the Craig Road. Um, if our children are sent home and she has to uh, obviously stay at home with them, what exact rights does she have in terms of pay and continued employment? <clears throat> Quite frankly, I, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, we would need to. Th th this is a cross-cutting issue. I mean, yeah. th th this impacts through the benefit system. It impacts from you know the Department for the Communities, um, and I think you know what we would like to present to the executive is a cross-cutting package of measures that could be signed off or considered to be uh, yeah. signed off. I, I'm, I, can, I will endeavour to to, um, to to find out the answer to that. But on a similar vein, there are issues around statutory sick pay. Um, and we do know that we do have the fall of competence here if the executive elected to do so to increase the amount of statutory sick pay. We've seen an uplift in Republic of Ireland. We've heard concerns from the business community that the £94 a week or whatever it is, it, it, it's, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of things in play here at the minute. Um, not, and, and trying to understand. First of all, what the budgetary position is, um, working very closely with the Department of Finance to see, well, this is your funding envelope, and what could we do with that reasonably? Um, and that is all going to have to be done you know, today. Um, OK. Um, in terms of staff retention, um, particularly in those sort of retail, leisure, and hospitality sectors, is there any, I suppose the answer is, <laughs> I know the answer, but I mean, what, what would your view be on sort of paying those staff some percentage of their wages until this crisis passes? Is that a measure that's being considered? I mean, that that is something that put it, will be put into the mix again for for consideration. Um, I, I don't I don't have a copy of the Chancellor's speech yeah. on me, but there was a small reference at the end, which, to be honest, sounded very like, um, let's look. At the, 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 I think there's there's schemes been announced in Denmark, but there's also been one uh, 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 announced down south. Yes. Which uh, I think it was announced in, in a fashion. We don't know how we're going to do it, but well, this it looks, is what we're going to do. It, it would yeah. look something like this, yeah. and it, it did sound like that was in the mix that that the Chancellor was re, 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 referring to, and obviously we're aware of the sort of the desired scheme. Uh, d down south, and that's you know that's you know certainly it would be one that 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 looks to be you know they're particularly up for this type of situation. In terms of just time scales, you said you know this needs to be done today. Uh, when do you think, in terms of a, a package being put together and approved by the executive, when do you expect that we can that we can expect some sort of public announcement on this? Again, it's probably it's you know I I would this will you know be, be put to ministers and it will be for ministers to announce it as uh, it goes through that machinery of government. I I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I mean it, it need, in my view, yeah, it needs to happen urgently. Yeah, this this week without putting words into the mouth or committing anybody to any particular actions. But you know. <coughs> Thank you. So can I just pick up? You say, obviously there are a number of other countries that are a little bit ahead of us in terms of, of dealing with this, um, and some of them have announced other measures like PAYE holidays and VAT holidays and things like that. And obviously businesses are, are asking for some of those things as well. Uh, and we may see some more announcements from the British Chancellor. Some of those things in the mix there. And also just to pick up on Christopher's point about the, the workers' rights. Are there things? You know, for example, we have. Um, workers who will be on contracts and who whose businesses may be closing, um, and in terms of, of their actual right to have, um, you know, sick pay or whatever at their salary contract and salary level, are, are we looking at how to deal with that from the, the kind of workers' rights aspect of it as well? Yeah, I mean, again, in the budget there was some uh, last Wednesday were some announcements around um, sort of safeguarding rights for workers in the gig economy and you know 
um, you know, around early payment of statutory sick pay and things. But again, this is something that will be very, very much in the mix um, and will be considered alongside the full uh, gambit yeah. of, of measures that could come into play here. Uh, and at this point, uh, there is a, you know, obviously, I think um, the finance minister on the radio this morning made, made the point to some extent um, um, because of the exceptional announcements by the Chancellor which is delivering uh, exceptional, unexpected, born of consequences. Um, that, in, in, in some way, sort of dictates part of the, 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 the timetable for us. Um, but I think there's also a, a, a strategic question for, for Northern Ireland here, and it's one that's probably um, hinted at in, 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 in some things. Um, our, our minister said, and, and, and within the minister, uh, within the, the department's note, which is around about ROI borrowing, which um, and, and the, the, the sort of it's, it's very easy to get to think about ROI borrowing to, to finance a measure, but there's a there, there, there's a strategic point over and above that, which is um, you know, uh, uh, there are we um, going to use the bonnet consequentials from the chancellor's announcements? And use those to fund the packages over here. Um, and you know, <coughs> some of the impressions um, are that in some cases the amounts wouldn't be quite sufficient for the equivalent exercises over here. Or are we going to do stimulus ourselves and do um, extra borrowing within you know, what, maybe akin to the, the exceptional circumstances that occurred around VES? <laughs> And, and so forth um, to, to finance additional activity as opposed to taking money from one one area and spending it in another area, which may be good in itself, but you know, the gross impact is a lot larger than the net impact because you're, you're, you're taking on giving, uh, whereas extra borrowing delivers fiscal stimulus now, albeit it's, it's, moving, it's time moving from future years into a year of, 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 of greater need. That's a, that's a, that, that, you know, it, it may not have sort of come across like that within the note, but that's that's a strategic point that has been that has been made around, <coughs> um, you know, there. To what extent does Northern Ireland do fiscal stimulus over and above any Barnet consequentials that might come through from Treasury announcements? Thank you, John Stewart. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Jen, so far for your presentation. Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say we're probably or could well be on the precipice of one of the worst economic disasters yeah. this you, the world has ever seen. I mean, 2008, which was catastrophic financially, at least people were still going to pubs, they were still staying in hotels, yeah. they were still flying around the world, they were still engaging with people, they weren't, people weren't being advised to stay away from the hospitality sector or out of theatres, they weren't being told to self-isolate, and this could go on for months, potentially into next year. Um, countries, as the chair have already said, are the, the new just measures. France, for example, has come out this week to say no business will go bust as a result of this, that every measure of support must be there, and we must follow suit. I truly believe that. Um, not just to put a statement out there, but uh, I think I appreciate the Department of Economy can't just act in its own right. It's, it's not, you're not the, the sole responsibility for this, but the likes of the loans that have been announced, I mean, that businesses can't wait three months. For this, they can't wait for grants or for support or for anything of deferral. So, in terms of what, what can you can do, if the money was there, what can the department do? What mechanisms are there in place? Is it a potential if something was set up out of Westminster, could that be copy and pasted and rolled out here? I'm conscious of the report that we heard this week and about putting stuff through too quickly and not scrutinising properly. But you know, this can't wait. Businesses are on to each of us on a daily basis, terrified of the impact of this. Uh, we need measures now. Um, in terms of insurance, I think many, especially in the hospitality trade, have been thrown under a bus because their insurance won't pay out. Many will have paid for comprehensive insurance but won't be entitled to claim on it because they have not been told to close. Their customers have been advised to stay away, which is tantamount to being forced to close. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that that's looked into in terms of how the department can mm. negotiate with insurance to support the hospitality trades? Yeah. Now, we've got a pile of others, as you can imagine, but there's no two to pick off. I mean, I could, in terms of, you know, what what could be about this, um, 
Oh, even before that, I do reckon you're absolutely right because in this particular case, and you're taking people out of the equation. <clears throat> I don't think it's ever happened before. No. People drive the economy, drive economic growth. <clears throat> that is the issue. Um, what, what, what are we going to do about this? Well, I mean, you know, there are there are deferrals, there are grants, and there are, um, and there and, and there are whether deferrals are under potentially tax. You can see how that is something that needs to come from the UK. But loans and grants, etc., are things that we could do. Now we do have schemes in place to invest in I and others, things like hardship funds, um, the rescue and restructuring funds for SMEs and large firms, um, cash grants, um, there are the business rich relief side of things, which again would be on, on the firm side of things. So there are existing schemes there, uh, jobs fund as well, if we cast our mind back to sort of 2011, 2012, um, which was around safeguarding employment. So the question is, what are we going to fund and, and what, what do we actually want to achieve? And I think it's really important to consider that in the context of what is the need um, of the economy at this point in time and what will be the need of the economy in two or three weeks' time um, so that we have that sort of complete policy picture and we're not just we're, we're trying to be proactive as opposed to just being reactive. Um, so, so, so the point is there are things there, and as Shane mentioned earlier, is work required just to assess, well, what are the, how quick can we go on these things? Um, but I suspect, given the urgency of the situation, um, things will have to be set aside and we will just have to move quickly. Again, kind of linked to the point I talked around, <coughs> whether Northern Ireland would do its own stimulus package over and above anything in the UK. You know, we, we have to be clear. There is going to be economic cost here. There's a question of who bears it. Um, and broadly speaking, it'll be borne by a combination of, 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 of three actors, for want of a better word. And the question is, to, to what degree is the balance between that? Um, one of those is workers. People who lose their job. One of that, one of those is employers and sort of the, the sort of shareholders. To what extent do they absorb the hit while waiting for, for things to pick up? And then there is the question of um, whether the exchequer, and sort of society, and, and future generations or, 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 or future taxpayers. Bear it. There is a cost, but depending on the action taken, there can be a different balance between that. And I suppose, speaking very frankly, that's why um, a lot of economists around the world are looking to th the degree of fiscal action um, to sort of to, to gauge the extent to which society in the future bears bears that. To minimise the extent to which people and business bear it during this period, so that's that, that's that's that is the big for context. Big question. Sorry to cut across you. Okay. For context, the Germans have literally just finished paying reparations for WW1. Look, how long are we going to be paying for this? Um, I don't know how long we'll be be paying for 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 for, for this. Um, I don't think it was actually all that long ago that the UK. Paid us last war born bonds as well, uh, yeah. if I remember rightly, from a few a few years back. Um, uh, certainly, um, the, the, the chancellor didn't give away anything in that, but the the the, the, the Taoiseach at his address, who there I think was 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 much more candid about this that the bill is going to be enormous. We're going to be paying it for years, and. Um, uh, I think there's every ex every expectation on my part <coughs> that the bill will be enormous and we will be paying it for years. And then, that, as I say, that does lead to a strategic question for, for the executive around um, whether we um, sort of maintain our efforts at using the border consequentials in the best possible way or whether we seek to use our borrowing power to do some of that stimulus ourselves. 
I can't just be sorry, the, um, just mindful that we have to hear from um, Donal and John as well, and some of the questions may be relevant to them. So just sorry. just to keep that in mind. Sorry, go ahead, Christopher, if you want to. No, no, what was I, I mean, I cut across John. <laughs> so it's John. Sorry. Uh, just just to and follow. Also just kind of keep an eye on. on yeah, the no, it's it's not even more of a question. It's just a follow up on that. I totally get that the. The, the path and approach to this will come probably from the executive with, with, with Westminster. Whatever needs done though, or whatever is decided, has to be done immediately. You know, we, we don't exactly. have time yep. to go to Northern Ireland for this delay dally in this. Yep. Businesses need this yesterday. Yep. And you know, there are some that are literally running to stand still at the minute, and yep. those packages have to be made available and everything. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. John. Uh, th thank you to you both for your very sobering um, and comprehensive report. Um, and I appreciate you won't have, and how could you have the answer to all the questions? Um, but I, I was listening to various radio shows this morning and television shows, and there's a different, there's a variety of issues being talked about. But there's only one problem we have to solve in the next six to twelve weeks, and that's stopping the spread of the coronavirus and saving as many lives as possible. That's the priority yeah. for government. And that's not a criticism of you guys or your department because there'll be committees meeting around this building and they'll be looking at the different aspects of it. But we just need to keep ourselves focused. There's one problem that we have to solve and that's what we have to do. So in terms of the economy, rip the rule book up or put it in the bottom drawer of the desk and lock it away for the next six months because it isn't going to work in these circumstances. And, and, and Shane, you made a very... A valid comment towards the end of your presentation with last week's RHI report. That, I'm not quoting you directly, yeah. but that hangs over us all. Put it in the bottom drawer as well and lock it away. Because the rule book will not bring us through this situation. What we need to do is get money out the door into businesses, into workers' hands to ensure that there is a money supply going through the system and that. Uh, that those resources are best used in terms of maintaining a business sector for when this crisis is over, for keeping people's roofs over their heads, and for keeping food on the table. That's the objective in my mind for the next three to six months. Uh, so I can assure you, from my point of view, that uh, it would be a very, very foolish MLA a year from now to set an official down in front of them and start criticising them over the response to this crisis. A very, very foolish official. Or to bring a minister in and say, oh, you spent X amount on the account book says it's not valid. Absolute crazy idea to be involved in any of that. So uh, what we need, as I've said, there's money coming through. It may or may not be enough. Get it out the door. Uh, I think in terms of the priorities for the executive, I don't think there's many people complaining about potholes, overgrown hedgerows, street lights out, or anything else for the next period of time. So every resource we have has to go towards this. But uh, so th that's a general comment. The one question I want to ask you, Shane, is you refer to disruption of supply chains. Uh, I just want to clarify that for for because we have been telling, particularly in relation to food supply chains, we have been telling people that food supply chains are intact. Are you referring to manufacturing uh, and how, how, how concerned should we be about that? Um, supply chain in, impacts um, to date, they haven't been nearly as observable to us as demand side impacts. So we have lots of observations of hotels, tourist attractions, restaurants and so forth where demand has fallen off a cliff. We do know of some companies that are having difficulties um, you know, they're sourcing some things from China, sourcing th some things from Italy because their factories are, are, shut, are, are shut down. And maybe Donald could give you uh, so, some examples. So the, in terms of relativity of observed impact to date, it has been overwhelmingly demand side impacts that have been observed much less so supply chain impacts. Now, at a UK level, they do talk about concerns about you know, automotive supplies and uh, supplies for um, aviation, you know, building aeroplanes and so forth. Um, uh, certainly in relation to automotive, we don't do a lot of, of that. 
over here, we're, we're, we're obviously, you know, there's some big car factories over in England that are, that are linked into global supply chain. So what we are observing to date is overwhelming on the demand side, but there are still examples on, on the supply chain side. But certainly I haven't personally heard now whether anyone else uh, has come across examples which um, you know, lead, lead to questions about, for example, foods or, or, or stock. I have no reason to believe, um, and any evidence that I have seen, um, of, 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 of concerns on, 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 on the food side. What, what I do see is, um, um, uh, I think there's a, there's, there's a bit in a report about um, where Kantar have looked back to the experience during the SARS outbreak and the sorts of buying habits that occurred then that seem to be, to some extent, re re be, be, being re re repeated now. And uh, that, sort of, that sort of panic buying aspect. Um, but certainly, I have no intel as of yesterday about that would sort of, uh, that would, 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 would cause me in the sort of monitoring system that we do to, to flag up a a, a, a food supply chain type type issue, okay. but uh, I cannot guarantee that there won't be some products that are, uh, I, 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 but I haven't come across it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation, and it is very very sober. This is um, primarily a health crisis, um, but it is also. An economic and social crisis, and it's, I suppose, a crisis pileup, you would call it. Um, businesses are closing down, not as a precaution, they're closing down to save lives. You know, it's as simple as that. Uh, and for those small businesses, uh, cash is king. And as, as uh, Richard Ramsey said earlier today, the king is dead. You know, they've dried up no amount of loans from, from the Treasury. Is actually going to help this this situation. You know, you take away the customer base. You know, it, it's it's not. I mean, we're not at the point now of even talking about economic stimulus. We're you know, stimulus, economic stimulus is a way down the line. What we're trying to do is protect um, the future economy uh, and be, uh, uh, and protect. Um, the employees so that they have potential to come back in again. So one of the key things that I would be really concerned about is this emergency employee payment, um, you know, for people that are just not able to go to work, and there will be thousands of them, uh, and, and, and it's how we deal with that emergency. But the emergency, and it is urgent, and it's now, and I think, you know, that the Chancellor did hint at that and I think probably today we'll hear more of that and it's about how to get that cash um, into um, into the economy now and that really is about people being able to put a loaf of bread on the table uh, why, why the, the economy is shutting down it's shutting down and, and, and we've got to accept that uh, and we have to see what kind of you know loans picking businesses like the hospitality Ask them to take out more loans when they don't even know where their particular sector is going. The, after this crisis, our economy is going to be totally different. You know, we will be looking at, for example, you know, we'll probably see fewer airlines. We'll probably see fewer cruise ships. We'll probably, you know, so we can't go in and start throwing money at businesses that maybe have a lesser future. Uh, in the future, we have to be very, very careful, careful, and protect our people first. Uh, and this is all about saving lives and, uh, and saving families uh, from, from distress. And that's where I think you know all our resources need to be at this particular moment in time in order to get it over uh, what the peak as it's coming now in the next four or five weeks. Uh, 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 and saving as many lives as possible, and, and I just you know the economy is important, but it's important from the social aspect. We need it to come back again, and that's whatever preparations we do now. It's to protect it for the future and to protect livelihoods uh, and people going forward. And that's not a question you've answered all the questions that people have put around here, but I do think the emergency employee payment has to be key. 
it, ju just to be clear in terminology, when I talk about economic stimulus, what, what I'm talking about, there's going to be lost demand. As, as I talked mm -hmm. about, there's going to be cost. It's, it's a question of who bears that. So what I'm talking about is, uh, you know, there, to what extent we use fiscal policy to replace lost demand. I'm not suggesting that we're going to come out of this with you know, cracking economic growth. It is, you know, there's going to be lost demand. The question is the extent to which fiscal policy steps forward and replaces some of that. So j j just to be clear with terminology, that is, that is what I mean when I use that. No, sorry if it's, if it's economists speak. <laughs> but um, that, 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 that is, I, I'm in no way suggesting that you know, we're going to have roaring economic growth as a result of this. Mm -hmm. This is fiscal stimulus to replace and I think you know Probably language is partly lost demand. Language is important. I mean, uh, Boris Johnson yesterday said the economy will bounce back. The economy will not be bouncing back. This is a long-term, uh, you know, crisis. There's no bouncing anywhere. And it, the other thing that I would just probably like to ask it's about our higher education. We know that the two uh, universities are closing down. And uh, you know, have you any idea or plans? People are going into their final exams. Um, you know, what is happening about the next intake of, of students and, and where we're, we're going with that and the preparations even for foreign direct or foreign students coming in? What is the further uh, and higher education plans? Um, but, uh, probably you aren't the officials to answer no, those questions. No, I, I, I might be in the same department. Yeah. yeah. I'm on the same floor as higher education, but I don't. Right. Okay. I, 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 I don't. I don't have any insights. We will get some clarity. Get some on that. Just, I'm, I'm very keen to make sure we don't get into speculation or anything like that, yeah. Chair. Just to be careful. Um, Claire, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose one of the biggest concerns that I have, and maybe it's not entirely possible, but it's the, the information, the practical information that both employers, employees, um, all sections within society are able to access, interpret and digest. Um, you know, certainly if I was giving a suggestion to the Minister, indeed the wider Northern Ireland Executive, it would be to set up a very specific web page in a similar way that RHI did, to basically uh, collate all the information, whether it's for employers, whether it's for schools, whether it's for healthcare and all of that. Appreciate the public health agency are taking it forward, but even if you access their website, they very much make clear that certain areas are not within their remit, so that information is not accessible. You know, I find myself as a, as a constituency MLA, you know, jumping between Northern Ireland Direct, UK Gov website, and, and, and all the other various kind of aspects of that. So, you know, if, if there is a suggestion, particularly for employers and employees, it is to make that information in one place become available. Even Facebook pages, you know, um, set something like that up. It's much easier for me as, a, as an elected rep to share that information if it already exists. Same with Twitter, retweeting and all of that type of thing. Because I do think the difficulty is, is that there is a lack of clarity around the information that currently exists. That could be that this is a very fast moving situation, everything's up in the air. Um, and it's, it's difficult to put things down here. But I think people need to know the current position as, as, as at all times. I suppose where I, I'm trying to advise people is particularly a lot of employees and employers are contacting me around their current responsibilities under employment law and contractual law. So, um, for example, you know, do they make people redundant? If they do that, that's a cost to their business, depending on the terms of their contracts. Um, if it's standard redundancy, is that going to cause them issues in terms of uh, getting back to normal, if you like, again in, in the future? Um, trying to advise employees, is it more fortuitous for them to take annual leave, you know, rather than just taking unpaid leave because they maybe can't afford that? Um, you know, should they be considering um, changing their contracts at this stage? And if they do that, is there an impact later down the line in terms of those contracts that if if they agree to this this change now, that may not be able to be changed back? So, is there is there prejudi prejudicial concerns that we have to be worrying about? Um, people, you know, if they're made redundant, the benefit that they can access at that point is job seekers. Um, if they're not made redundant but their in income is low, then the benefit within universal credit um, is, is income support. So it, it's all those types of things, practical concerns about what income people are entitled to, how they can access it. Um, and I appreciate some of this falls within the Department of Communities, particularly in relation to the benefits, but it, it, it's all these concerns that people are coming to me about. I, I'm being very tentative in some of the information I'm providing them with, other than saying this is how it currently stands. This could change. 
But to be honest, that's all any of us can go on. So I know there's a lot of kind of um, uh, just bursting out there, but I, I, I do worry about the impacts on employers, businesses get back up and running, employees, their rights, their entitlements. Um, and you know, how, how's the department considering all of these things? Yeah, I think that's a fair point because we do have the potential of things becoming quite unwieldy. It could be a lot going on at the one time. So, um, you know, we need to be honest with you. I don't have an answer to that question, yeah. but I'm. But if it provides you some reassurance, it is something that we are looking at to try and figure out how do we provide a single point of contact, mm -hmm. whether that be a helpline, whether it's through uh, NI Business Info or something beyond that. Um, so we're, we're alive to it, and yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll try to sort of work our solution around that. I think the other point I would make as well is. Um, there's a lot of confusion with the information coming from the Chancellor and what, how that extends to Northern Ireland. My, inter my understanding of it is, is that it doesn't, and it will really be up to the devolved administration to decide how they want to provide these things. And you know, so people are reading the 12-month <coughs> holiday um, uh, rates holiday and, and, and asking me, well, why is Northern Ireland not getting that? And you know, I'm going back to them and having to clarify that that's a devolved issue, and that 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 would be up to our finance minister to make those decisions in the Northern Ireland wide executive. Um, I think the other difficulty as well is not just in terms of the monies and the packages that are coming forward. I think it's the interpretation of if you self-isolate, can you then access sickness pay or are you having to take unpaid leave or are you potentially going to lose your job because you're absent without leave and all of that? Um, what does that mean? You know, um, Even the, the, th the three day, so it used to be on day, uh, day four, now it's gone back to day one. Has that even been uh, authorised in Northern Ireland? Yes. Has it? Because I understand it hadn't been, but they would get back pay. Um, I think it had been now. Okay, okay, great. Um, you know, so I think the difficulty, you know, so I have a parent contact me this morning saying that her child is displaying symptoms, so the whole family's going into self isolation. Northern Ireland Civil Service Management told her that she would have to take unpaid leave to do that. Is that right? You know, that to me that seems wrong. Mm -hmm. That information to me, she should be entitled to statutory sick pay. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that as a, as a devolved administration, we have a responsibility to interpret the information that's coming from the UK government and how that extends here. Um, it's all those worries and fears that people just don't know what to do. And these things are happening now. In relation to the UK Treasury announcements, usually Treasury announcements would occur in a managed way and there would be a big book for someone like me to go into the website and find out that detail, which would tell me, is this an England-only initiative? And are we getting a bar of consequential? Or is this a, some, something that's going to apply across the board? Last night, when I went on to the Treasury website, there was a copy of a speech. And then later on, there was a press release. There wasn't that big book that, that answers those, those, those questions. All we have got to go on is, 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 or at least as of last night, was, was, was words and speech, speeches. So that's why you know, the DOF need to be, uh, and I'm sure they are in the process, of finding the, 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 these things out. I suspect that is a, a function of the speed by which these things are, 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 be, are being done. With respect, I don't entirely accept that because I think issues like statutory sick pay are very much um, led by the UK government. That in itself isn't a devolved um, issue in the sense that um, they don't set the terms around that. Yes, I appreciate Northern Ireland could add to that. So I, I think if, if the UK government is, is coming out with statements where it is, um, it's their responsibility to take them forward, I think we, as an a devolved administration, should be in a position to be able to interpret the information. So it's not just about uh, calculating the Barnet consequentials. To me, it's about actually understanding the information and interpreting it. Um, and I think that can happen under the current sets of... My response wasn't in specific. To statutory sick pay, it was. But my question it, was. It, it was. It was the, the the general. I think you used earlier the rates example. Yes. So I, I, it was a it was a general answer, as opposed to specifically about some measure which you might reasonably deduce. Yeah. Whether it was um, devolved or not devolved, I think the the twenty five thousand grant is a is an example where we kind of suspect it's something that would need to be devolved, but you can't be sure until you see the detail. Yeah, and I appreciate that there are announcements that are happening and it will be up to the ministers to decide whether they wish to have those happen in Northern Ireland. But to me, it's it's the information that's also coming out of the UK government that we need to interpret. So to me, it's about 
as I say, interpreting and digesting that information because, I, I, and I'm sure other MLAs around this table are, are feeling the same, we're doing that in the evenings on Facebook, on email and all of that. Um, the department needs to be doing that, the executive needs to be doing that, um, so that people actually understand the information that's being put out and they can interpret it and then apply it to their own lives. So, thank you, Chair. Thank you, <coughs> Thanks, Chair, and thanks, gentlemen, for coming in. I suppose we all uh, agree with you know, what's been said. In relation to the department, you obviously there, there are there's staffing issues and we're all aware of those. Um, you know, I think that John was making the point, and I think it is important that the action is, fa you know, now fast tracked. You know, can you give us an assurance that the department has the resources to to take the necessary action and to plan for the, the difficult days ahead? And we appreciate the work that's been done to date. I'm not, I'm not in any way undermining that, but you know, you're obviously under pressure, and as all departments are. But do you have the necessary resources to, to deal with this emergency? Well, as a department, there will be the, the folks in the corporate services side, which which I'm not in. Um, I, I will, we'll be looking at um, business continuity. I think business continuity plans are already um, act activated. Um, you know, uh, they will be trying to scenario plan about how they deal with what will probably be some sort of upsurge mm. yeah, in, yeah. in in in. In, 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 in staff absence. So I'm not from the area of the department that can sort of confirm how well we will probably see you know, their CEO way through this. What I do know is that work is happening, and, and, and I can see it happening because I, I've been asked for the, for the same assurances that, 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 that others are. Um, what certainly we can say is that this is you know, absolutely top priority absolutely a, 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 yeah, good. A, 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 in, in the department i okay. don't know if keith, keith wants to add anything no, more no that's fine you've given us that assurance it's good right uh, the other point is about the supply chain and it is critical people are going to be sitting at home this is and i think it's a worrying factor for all of it all the impact of people sitting at home i think it worries us all mental health is a big issue in that as well but <coughs> number one people need food and supplies and they need pharmaceuticals it's going to be a lot of pressure building up, and uh, you know, are there any restrictions? And I was been, point, you know, any restrictions you're aware of in relation to the supply chain that have come in recently that would not have a knock-on effect on fresh food supplies and pharmaceuticals, especially. There's, there's nothing that. What, what I would have, um, uh, the one thing I would have heard was things like. Um, the times at which deliveries can be made to shops and so forth. I think there's some sort of I don't know the details, but I think there's some sort of restrictions about mm. at what time you can make 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 deliveries and, and, and stock things up. And I think I've heard at least a couple of instances around we need a bit more flexibility. Yeah. yeah. On <coughs> I know there if we're going to be potentially short of drivers, we may need more flexibility when yeah, we can I think drop it, drop yeah, off. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that is one thing I have absolutely heard. It's it's not quite the. the but has there any research been done on it? Well, uh, yeah. The other aspect of this is the civil contingency group, mm. which I understand is now being set up, chaired by the first and and deputy first minister. Now, that would be looking at what is the real world, the operational situation here. Are there uh, are fuel supplies being impacted? Are is the food <coughs> supply being impacted? Are there issues with going through ports and moving people about? Yeah, yeah. So that that is all happening, and those structures Dude. have been stood up. You know. Okay. The other big point, just about the banks, um, I met one of the, the business organisations, people this morning in the street, he made the point that a lot of small businesses wouldn't have great relationships with the local banks and therefore would have difficulty, you know, getting a loan. Is, have you had any discussions or aware of discussions that have gone on in relation to the local banks? Yeah, um, I'm aware that our, our minister uh, met with the banks uh, on Monday, and I am aware that the Department of Finance have been having conversations with the banks, um, you know, just to ensure that, I, 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 I'm not an expert in that section, but I think the messages bank, back from the banking sector have been encouraging. Um, liquidity is not an issue, and um, this is a fundamentally different 
issue to what happened in 2008 when you know yeah. the nucleus yeah. of the financial system failed. So um, I think the, there, again, not to speak for the banks and not to speak for what conversations might have already taken place, but there is a, the banks recognise that they need to work very closely with the businesses that they support to, to help them through this period. Quite how that will play out in terms of a package of support, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know those conversations are taking place, and that is a live work stream. Okay, thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank thanks, you Chair. Both, and, uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. And John, thank you very much. I'm sure we'll probably have you back again sometime soon. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. I'm sorry for keeping you. We we have are implementing our, our social distancing, so we couldn't have four people at at once. So apologise right, for, for that. that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And just in relation to some of the, the questions that have been asked in, to, the, to the two officials previously, maybe you would like to comment on um, some of the supply chain issues in, in your opening as well? I, I'll, I'll pick up on the economic side, on the supply chain, on the export side, Chair. Okay. Well, Whichever one of you is going first. Yeah, okay. I, I suppose I'd kick off because I suppose the impact of all of this is really on the, the tourism and hospitality sector. Um, very, 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 very quickly, um, and I suppose it's sort of difficult to put into words just the impact this has had on the industry. Um, it's uh, it's probably fair to say it's nothing short of catastrophic. Um, and it's sort of hard to believe the last time I sat in front of this committee was only five weeks ago, and we were talking about doubling the value of tourism to the Northern Ireland economy over the next ten years. Um, so it's an industry that you know, the private sector, government, and the community and voluntary sector has built up to become a £1 billion industry, employing 65,000 people and 5.2% of Northern Ireland's GDP. Right. Five weeks later, it's probably fair to say that what we're looking at here is a really an existential threat to, to the future of that, of that sector. Um, in January, when, when we last met, um, our concern was loss of bookings from China. And I think our view then was, let's not worry about that, because you know, that was a you know, not a significant share of the market. Um, and indeed, sort of over January and February, the industry performed quite well. It was on a par with a, a record-breaking <coughs> year last year. But the outbreak of the, the coronavirus really in Europe, particularly in Italy, you know, a number of weeks ago, that led to a really instant nervousness amongst travellers and the impounding of cruise ships. just led to a real reluctance of people to travel um, by consumers. And we started to see cancellations queries begin to rise, bookings of travel agents across the globe started to dry up. I was in the United States with the Minister just last week. I think there was a sense at that time that you know this was something that will pass and we looked towards how do we sort of move towards business in the, in the second half of the year. Um, and things have just dramatically changed really over the course of, of that week. And as days pass, that, the rate of that change uh, just gets greater. Uh, Tourism Ireland, last week took the decision to discontinue its marketing because it was clearly obvious that nobody was wanting to travel and the view was let's hold on to whatever resource that we have in order to do the marketing and the campaign uh, later in the year. And I think that when we looked at that, we thought that might be late spring, um, early summer. But we then launched our campaign in the Republic um, and in Northern Ireland really to try to drive um, business from, from the island of Ireland. <coughs> And that seemed to be running quite well, but all of the decisions really which were taken in the course of the, the last week, uh, the decisions you know, to close pubs in the south, uh, ask people not to congregate, um, airlines closing down, borders closing, um, asking people to avoid gathering in bars and restaurants, visitor attractions and venues, that's really all led to just a, a rapid closing down of virtually the whole of the, the Northern Ireland tourism industry. Um, and in the last 48 hours, we have seen bars, restaurants, hotels, visitor attractions, conference venues, museums, and activity providers all closing their doors. Um, and whilst this is partly due to a decline in, in visitor numbers, it's also very much in an effort to protect the public and to protect the staff of the people who are employed in those businesses. And I think yesterday evening, you know, we, we have had the announcements of Titanic Belfast closing, the Biancor Group, and Colin and um, Janice uh, are, are sitting behind me here. I mean, they will be able to tell you of what is actually happening as 
on the minute because they no doubt will be getting phone calls and text messages uh, telling us what's happening. But I mean, it's probably fair to say that as we sit here, we are seeing the, the Northern Ireland tourism ecosystem uh, closing down. Um, and it is an ecosystem because all of these businesses are dependent upon one another. You know, hotels are dependent on restaurants, restaurants are dependent upon uh, activity providers. Uh, and whilst we're seeing, I suppose, um, you know, the big picture uh, announcements being made, you can rest assured that behind all of that, there are activity providers, there are small one-man band operations, all of which are now finding it extremely difficult, and all of which are looking towards how do we cocoon ourselves, how do we basically close down and protect ourselves and put ourselves into a position that when we um, get some light at the end of this tunnel, we will be in a position to return to um, return to the business. So, I, mean, I think it's fair to say, and the argument has been made previously, and by members around the table, you know, we really do need immediate action to be taken, um, because if we don't, there is the realistic prospect that we will have lost 3,000 businesses and all of those 65,000 jobs in that, in that sector may have disappeared. Um, so it's really an imperative that we, we are ensuring the survival of the sector um, so that we have an industry to work with when, when uh, demand returns. It's probably fair to say that that could be longer term than it might be for other sectors. Um, tourism is very much dependent upon people having discretionary spend. Um, I think given the messages that were coming from the, the two previous uh, colleagues from the department, you know, we look like we're heading into a pretty deep, dep uh, deep depression. Um, I suppose <coughs> tourism spend is not going to be the first thing in front of people's minds. They'll be looking at things like putting food on the table and clothing their kids and uh, looking after the necessities. So it could take some time before the industry bounces back. Um, and I would agree with uh, the Deputy Chair. I don't think it is going to bounce back. It is going to take a period of time. Uh, over which this is going to be done. Um, there was a debate around um, supply chains. Uh, what we potentially have here are 65,000 people who come from a service industry who are used to dealing you know, in, in some of the areas where perhaps we might find some shortages in, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, so if we're looking at things like you know, food production, Food distribution. We, you know, potentially have got people who are used to working in kitchens who can cook. We have got people who will have been driving coaches and uh, taking visitors around who have got, you know, the ability to drive uh, vehicles. So, uh, one of the things that we are currently starting to look at, along with colleagues in SIB and other parts of government, is ca how can we very quickly start to put some sort of system in place that allows us to identify who might be available from within these sectors and how can we potentially redeploy them into areas which will help uh, move towards supporting the, uh, the need of the, um, the greater need of, of society at this point in time. Um, just picking up on the point that uh, Claire made with regard to, um, I suppose, the requirements for information from the industry itself. I mean, what we've been trying to do really over the last week, in the first instance, was really to make sure that we were collating information from all the sources that it was coming, just to get a sense of the scale of the challenge that lay ahead. I suppose we had a survey done, which we completed on Friday. I mean, that's now obsolete, you know, in terms of what that was telling us. You know, we are, we are in a completely different space now. Uh, what we are moving to today is trying to engage consultants who, through ourselves, we can connect to industry uh, where we can provide advice on some of those issues that we were talking about, like uh, some of the employment law, contractual law, financial management, uh, where we can. Um, we do not have the skill sets within the organisation ourselves to provide that advice, uh, but what we want to do is to make sure that we can use whatever resources that we have to direct people to those places where that advice can be given. Um, and I'm just on the back of the co comments that were made by uh, our, our colleagues earlier, we will after this meeting, touch base with the department to see what, what they had in mind, because I suppose to some extent we're all working very quickly. Uh, we're trying to respond as quickly as we can, and perhaps we could be um, a, little, a little bit uh, more joined up in that. Um, I have colleagues from the industry coming, coming behind us who will get into a lot of that detail and give you a real, I suppose, picture of what we're trying. But I think 
just to echo the points that have been made earlier, you know, time really is of the essence. We are seeing businesses close by the hour, and we really have to act as quickly as we possibly can. Otherwise, you know, we are going to see ourselves in a position where we won't have those businesses in place to respond to a return or to a response when, when that uh, opportunity comes along. Thank you. Okay, Chair, um, thank you. Just following on some of the comments, I will make, I've kind of repeated before, but I'm kind of coming from an invest and I perspective, and maybe just to the point that, that John had made, we acknowledge this first and foremost as a, a health issue, um, but it is having a detrimental impact in terms of, of the economy. There is a domino effect here. Um, I'll just run through um, some of the points. As John said, ecosystem is starting to close down, and, and the economy. There is an ecosystem within the economy that links into health and every other part of the industry as well. It's absolutely right that um, tourism, travel, and hospitality were, were the, f the first line. They, they were hit first of all, and those businesses that we work with and support were the first to raise up in terms of issues and, and concerns. But that's now a domino effect, and we are getting multiple calls from businesses right across. Um, industry sectors, um, whether that is advanced manufacturing and engineering, um, some food and drink companies, automotive, even down to companies who are working with universities, training and support companies. So it's just a domino effect in terms of if, if, it, if, it, if the tourism industry closes down or aviation industry closes down, food companies that are supplying into the avi aviation industry, that market goes. If they're supplying tourist resorts, that market goes as well. On Friday, we had we have a comprehensive um, customer contact management system um, that we log calls as, as they come through with 58 businesses in distress on Friday. Um, that increased to 150 on Monday. Um, and literally when I was sitting behind you, um, it increased by another 40 in the last hour. Um, so it, it's, it's, the impact is it's just it's a, an avalanche, as John has said. In terms of um, a lot of the announcements that were made yesterday, they, the stimulus uh, announced by the Chancellor, the overwhelming feedback I'm getting from businesses are that loan guarantee schemes, deferrals, rates, holidays, time to pay, they're all very, very useful, but they're not going to work in the current situation. I spoke to a business this morning just before I came in whose current wage bill is uh, £2 million a month. A, a PAY deferral is £500,000. It's great, but it isn't going to be a difference between the business surviving and going out of business. Um, so overwhelmingly, from our perspective, what we're finding, we're logging what the calls, the calls are. Some of them are supply chain, I'll, I'll come on to that in a moment. Some of them are export related. Some of them are HR related in terms of concerns, a lot of the points that Claire had raised earlier on. But fundamentally, this is about cash flow. That's, that's the overwhelming issue that has been raised and what companies are asking us for information is in terms of how do we pay wages and salaries of businesses. Um, Keith referred to it earlier on in terms of um, Jobs Fund. Jobs Fund we delivered back in the financial crisis, um, back in 2008, 2009. That was an employment scheme in order to create jobs. Um, it was very useful in terms of that it created 10,000 jobs over a one-year period, but that was putting people back into employment. This is about sustaining people in employment. What we need to do, um, and the, the comment has been made for, is, is hoarding skills. Um, we, we need to, to sustain businesses that they can keep the skills that they have because, as, as uh, has been made by Sinead, we're going to come back out of this at some stage. And all the research has shown before is that if you make people redundant uh, and then try and start up again, you will incur significantly more cost trying to attract and train those people. It is much cheaper in the system overall. And back to John's point before, I think we do have to rip up the rule book here um, and, and basically make sure that we keep businesses going. We, we probably are going to have to at some stage. We have. Um, 1,538 companies that we work with intensively across a whole range of sectors. Is the financial stimulus going to be available to provide support to them? And the other 130,000 businesses across Northern Ireland, no, we're not. We're probably going to have to get to the stage where we're going to have to prioritise which sectors and which subsectors get support because of the dependency that they have um, ac ac across the piece. Um, in, in terms of um, how we actually put that, that support in. We do have a range of schemes. We just need approval. Things like buying time schemes, rescue and restructuring, hardship funds, employment support. We can operate those. There's, there's some rules and regulations. Buying time, for example, is a £5,000 offer per employee. It's a loan that has to be repaid within six months. In the current circumstances, that's not going to work. So we need to basically um, deliver support to businesses that will keep them um, um, sustained. And, and currently, in terms of the Northern Ireland market with uh, the banks. Total lending to businesses at, at the moment is, is in the order of £7 billion. That's the level of indebtedness. Businesses are saying, in some instances, they can't 
take on additional debt. So there needs to be something else rather than, than debt. Um, just in, in terms of a potential positive chair, we have um, quite a significant number of businesses that have come through and actually offered support. Um, so companies who have uh, logistics, they have vans, trucks, lorries, are offering those to the health service and other services um, and they're freely available, um, which I think is commendable in the current circumstances. Um, we also have a number of companies who are shifting production. Um, you know, last week there was a call for ventilators. Mm -hmm. We have companies that are now um, switching production to provide components for ventilators and other critical um, elements as well, uh, which again is very positive. And that's been done directly through BAEs. There's, there's, there's a specification on the work line. So we're filtering all of that through at the moment. In, in terms of um, uh, the current situation, are, are there job opportunities? Uh, actually, there are. And I'm, I'm very, very sensitive um, about this. Um, we have a lot of food companies who have vacancies at the moment, um, but they understand the issue in terms of people losing their job elsewhere. But there are potential vacancies in some of those industries because there is an increased demand um, in some of those sectors. Um, so we, we will be looking to engage with John and colleagues in terms of people who are potentially being made redundant in certain areas. How can we get those people moved into food production areas because they have the skills, um, the hygiene qualifications and the capabilities in terms, in terms of doing that. Um, uh, but but it, I'm just concerned that it might be misinterpreted in terms of you know one person has taken advantage of some somebody else's uh, uh, um, mm -hmm. concerns and, and that's not the case. But but we do have businesses that are looking for employees at the moment. And just maybe last um, end on the point that, that Claire had made. We have NI Business Info. We are trying to use NI Business Info as our business information website, um, and we are updating that um, constantly. Um, so if anybody has any information uh, or if there are things that aren't. Uh, available, uh, we would direct them to any business info. If there are gaps there, um, please let us know and we'll, we'll try and fill those gaps as, as and when we can. Um. Thank you. Members, I'm very conscious that we have the industry representatives yeah. here um, and obviously everybody's time is important and um, we may want to hear those briefings and then ask questions if that, mm -hmm. if yeah. that might yeah. be yeah. a lot of members are content with if, that. Chair, if, if John and Donald are able yeah. To, to hang on, I, I yeah. appreciate you might not be able to. Or no, 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 uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, if we bring the industry forward, then. this as fully as possible and because it is such an important issue to us all. Um, so I'd just like to, to welcome Joanne Stewart, um, Chief Executive of NI Tourism Alliance, Alliance sorry, excuse me, um, Colin Neal, Hospitality Ulster and Janice Galt of the Hotels Federation. Um, if you just want to give us a presentation, um, whoever wants to go first. Um, thank you, Chair and Committee, for your um, time today. Um, I think uh, really what we want to be saying today that this is um, happening on the ground now, and I know Colin and um, Janice will have lots of information with regards to what we're actually seeing happening. Um, I think you need to understand that this is a wave that is hitting the economy and tourism hospitality and the hotel sector are right at the forefront of that wave. This includes coach companies, tour guides, cruise ships, um, the, uh, attractions, the direct marketing organisations. This is hitting tourism and it's on its knees. Um, and I think, um, you know, we've been warning that we've seen this starting, but we, we now, to see, now need to see action immediately. And this is about business survival. This is a not, not about business continuity at the moment. This is about survival and supporting um, the staff and, and, and employees. Um, what I'd, with the um, support from uh, the UK Chancellor yesterday, what I would like to say is that 20 billion of that was direct, so we have got our share of that, and my understanding is that's in excess of 500 million pounds has been allocated to Northern Ireland to support businesses, and we need to see how that is going to be allocated. Um, 
and um, that needs to be focused. So tourism is right at the start of this and is, is feeling that now. There are some sectors that um, actually are working flat out, as we heard at the moment. So any mitigations need to be really focused. The £25,000 that everybody has mentioned is only relates to small businesses in leisure, retail and tourism. It does not relate to every single part of the economy. And I think at this point we have to be very um, focused. Um, so I, I'm going to pass to um, uh, to colleagues. Um, I think we'll just keep this concise, and then we can we can answer questions. So, Janice, um, I represent the hotel sector and really the serviced accommodation sector, which is round about 450 premises in total. In the period of time that I've been sitting here, I've had 35 messages from people, about 12 of them around closures. So that gives you an idea of how immediate this is. None of this is about survival. All of this is about paying people. And that's all anybody's really interested in. The real issue is that if you let somebody go today, and just for any members who are worried about their own spouses or otherwise, you have to go to a job centre, you have to apply for unemployment benefit, and that can take a period of time. Mm -hmm. The system that they've put in the South is that you're able to log in online, you're able to get a six-week, 203 euro at a minimum allowance. If we let people go today, they cannot do that. To put this in context, hotel wage bills are roughly between 20 and 25 million pounds per month. So unless you're doing a turnover that is able to, most hotels operate on a profit margin of around between 8 and 10 percent. And if you don't have any business, you're not paying anybody. And that is where we are at this moment in time. It is really confusing for people when the Chancellor stands up and makes one announcement. And it is unclear as to whether that applies to people here or whether it doesn't. Um, it is insulting to offer us a three months rate relief as opposed to the year that the UK have been offered. An NAV of £51,000 and cascading down for that is great and fantastic and I wish really good luck to everybody who falls into that category. The average hotel rate bill is £138,000. £138, Some hotels pay £20,000 a week in rates. Giving them a holiday until June is grand, but it is utterly meaningless because zero percent of you know percent of zero, fifteen percent of zero is still zero, and that's where we are. We would like to see deferments of PAYE, the payments of VAT, the payments of government money. There's three different things here: one, giving us money; secondly, taking money off us; and three, loaning us money. Yeah. Loaning us money may, in the longer term, bring us back. Taking money off us at the moment is simply scandalous. Mm -hmm. Um, offering us loans is tokenism and giving us a three months rate relief is a complete and utter cop out. And somebody needs to come up with a methodology where the devolved nations are getting the information in a clear and concise form. And that we are really at that stage at the moment. John makes the point we need to be cocooned, put into mothballs for a period of time where we can actually come back and offer people a good service and a reasonable service and bring some normality back to community, which will suffer both mentally, physically and financially. And I think that's something that we are looking to government to do. And so far, I genuinely have to say, I would struggle to find one single one of my members who would say that they have received any significant or practical support. Paul, over to you. Members, thank you. Uh, for those who don't know, it's Hospitality Ulster, um, with members right across the hospitality industry. Normally, I'd say how big they are, but maybe today I'll say I represent members who paid off 800 staff, paid off 150 staff, paid off 40 staff, 20 staff, 5 staff. It's like a domino effect. You know, while I'm talking to you, they're ongoing. Um, say, I have spent the morning with, I spoke to the finance minister this morning, we have our own recovery group. I'm halfway through speaking to all the heads of banks. As an industry, we are doing everything we can to protect our people. This is four months for us. The first ask we have is get an emergency payment programme in place for our staff because they need bread on their table. That is the most important thing for us. And also, I would appeal to stop the clock on their domestic bills. Mm -hmm. you know, that starts to create space for our staff and also for our businesses to actually then consider how they react and, and put them out there. When it comes to a business, you know, I, I appreciate you know the the, the three three months um, rate holiday. 
is what was available before the budget. Um, but now we need to implement the 100% one year rate. And I appreciate it, it's targeted, but I think that's justified because the hospitality sector, whilst you know tourism is 60% 60, 60 of tourism spend money with us, it's not 60% of our industry. You know, we're in every village, town, street, uh, and pretty much every family will have somebody working for us. I, mean, I think it's vital that we move and copy G uh, England with the, the year break on rates targeted at the whole hospitality sector. The £25,000 grants, we need them, we need them now, we need a simple form, we need it on the ground as I speak. Uh, on the leg of the loans, some businesses may find them useful. The problem is you know, building more debt. You know, we actually legally could become insolvent and would have to actually declare it because you can't take on more debt than your actual assets. So I, I don't see the loans really helping us, to be honest. They might buy a bit of time and then you'll fall over anyway. But we do need to know they're there, the channels, stuff for those that, that want them. Our utility bills, you know, our rates, you know, everything must be frozen. Our industry must be frozen in time today. You know, stop the clock on everything we have to pay and feed our staff. That's really where we need to be in this. I mean, it's not about what government can afford, it's what government needs to do. Thank you. Can I just add one point that um, I think this is about tourism and the wider hospitality and accommodation sector. Um, so I don't think we can just look at one particular sector, even in the in the UK, they're looking at leisure, um, hospitality and retail. And I think it's important that we have to, we do look at that. Um, this affects the whole of tourism, as I said. Um, it's um, you know it's coach, uh, it's coach operators, it's um, tourist attractions, it's the cruise ship business, um, and all of this impacts on hospitality and accommodation as well. So we, we do need to look at this as as a whole. Thank you. Very yeah. We have a list of people. We have a list from the previous briefing. If we use that one. Mm -hmm. That's um, and some of the questions, obviously, John and Donald may, may want to pick up on. Um, look, I, I just want to say thank you very much for coming along to, to this morning. Um, I think it's absolutely vital that, that we hear from you, um, because obviously you're dealing with it directly on the ground. Um, and many of the issues that you have raised will have been raised with us individually as well by, by businesses. Um, and there are a lot of questions and, and not a lot of clear cut answers at this time um, and it's very important that we all work together to, to try and get some of those answers out to people as quickly as possible. Um, for example on the utilities, like I spoke to NIE yesterday and I, I know that they are working with supply companies and as to how they can support customers um, going forward and that includes business customers. So I do think that we need to hear from you and um, we're, we're very, very grateful for your time this morning. Um, Sinead, if you want to go. Hi, okay, thank you very much. It's very, very sobering. Um, it's safe to say that the global tourism economy has this been wiped out, really. You know, and it is, it's the complete ecosystem, uh, as you said, uh, Joanne, and it has such a knock on effect uh, to everybody's lives. We'll all be affected by it. Um, and yes, you're absolutely clearly right. I mean, I'm speaking to hoteliers and they are just considering mothballing um, because it's not coming back uh, soon and, uh, and it's going to take a while to come back after uh, we get over it because it'll have done such major damage to confidence as well like, and psychologically uh, in relation to travelling uh, uh, and, uh, and even um, socialising in a way. It, it, it's going to change everything, so we have to we have to look at making sure we're not taking money out of the industry now, in any shape, form, or fashion. Um, no, no industry in this section is in a position um, to have money taken out because nothing's coming into it. So that has to happen. Uh, that has to be the next step. Um, and, and also, the, uh, I mean, in this. Catastrophe, is there any way or have you given any consideration to how um, maybe some of the hotels can be adapted for some frontline emergencies that are coming? You know, people will need to get into isolation. They may not be able to stay at home and get into isolation uh, uh, and things like that. So I'm just wondering, has, has that been considered within the Federation itself? Yes, there is a, um, 
There are a number of schemes in relation to this which are being run by the Department of Health mm -hmm. um, for a variety of things, either for health workers, isolation units or alternative. A number of hotels currently have people staying in them. They actually cannot go home because they've either been in a place where the coronavirus has been prevalent or they have a family member who is self-isolating. Mm -hmm. um, the real issue for hotels is much and all as they can kind of close down nearly all of them are going to have to have some form of skeleton staff and you know a few issues have been raised in this security um, you know how much you keep open um, how that but we have actually looked very closely at that um, the Department of Health have been in touch with a number of properties who will have different uh, needs and aims and we've also been in touch with a couple of other sectors, the healthcare sector, the retail sector, and particularly nursing homes, where we have skills that actually are a mirror onto their yeah. um, skill base, and they have taken some employees, and a number of employers have been very keen to give, particularly their more casual staff, um, a means of employment in the coming weeks. Can I just add something to that? Yeah. Um, we are seeing, um, I think we're really starting to see innovation within um, the industry as well. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing people who are moving to takeaway. We've seen the National Trust and other attractions who are keeping open gardens and parks and really looking at how they can provide, because people are going to need that. Yeah. Um, so um, you're, you're seeing that. And also it was industry that was driving tourism and I with regards to the, you know, um, the redeployment of skills and how, how can we make that um, easy for people. So I think, you know, the public good is at the heart of what everybody is doing um, and everybody is looking at, at how they can can redeploy and, and provide services and just a question to Donald um, in, in relations not just um, the tourism but um, you know there's some of our industries um, our manufacturing industries we're going to take the unusual step of letting people speak from the public gallery I'm not entirely sure if camera and microphone will pick you up but I just think for the situation in the immediacy mm -hmm. that's where we are and particularly in some of the manufacturing industries, um, there are. Um, no. Do you, do you want to do, 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 just do it as it is? It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, particularly within some of the manufacturing industries, you know, uh, they may be able to adapt um, their 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 Speaking business right. in order to um, deliver some frontline. Um, necessities. We talked about the ventilators, but you know, other there are other industries as well. Apparently, Randox um, have capacity to do testing. Are we giving them any support so that they can ramp up as quickly as possible uh, within within Invest NI? Yeah, we're in daily contact with all of our customers. So if there are stress issues or opportunity issues, we are capturing and responding. To those. But are you being proactive and trying to see if we can write? That's okay. Thank you. In terms of the employment opportunities we are doing, I have a survey at the moment around all of our food companies in terms of identifying where there are vacancies, which we will then make available to the colleagues later on. So, yes, there are proactive calls going. All of our staff at the moment are working remotely, but they are in contact with their client companies and it is uh, identifying whether there are issues, stresses and opportunities and what those specifically are. That's all logged centrally and then we can scrape all of that onto the central system and identify where opportunity trends are. So yes, that, that is happening on a real-time basis. Donald, just to come in on that, is that going to continue yes. or, so that we can continue to identify? Yeah. That, that, that's, that's just a, a <coughs> not, that's not a one-off contact with um, companies that has happened on a regular basis. Direct contact on a daily basis. Not. We see we see some um, some companies, for example, um, the company M MJ's M uh, that that have lost an awful lot of business because of uh, of crews. Um, but they have got a particular type of skill set where they can uh, build rooms, build you know even if it's short term um, accommodation. Have we considered? them adapting their uh, skill set in order maybe for us to build temporary accommodation for people that may need it quickly. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Because we, we, have, um, we have lots of construction and manufacturing companies that can change the way work what they're doing in terms of production facilities. So, so yes, um, if there is an opportunity, if there are clean, clean rooms required, 
Um, I had a conversation with someone, the construction company, they can actually convert tenants into hospitals. If those are the sorts of things that are, that are needed, we have businesses that have the capability to do that. And then just... We, we can identify those businesses, we know exactly what their skill sets are. Um, so just in terms of the ventilator, the request came through for beds. Once we saw the specification of what we were looking for, we knew exactly which of our companies. So injection molding companies um, can, can, can work on ventilator systems. They weren't doing it before, but they have the capability. And how are they doing it? Um, yes, at the moment, in terms of those ventilators, what the best have asked for is that those companies basically perform a specification, um, and, and that's, that's happening in real time as well. There's, there's an online system that will feed the information in. And then just a wee quick one to Colin. Um, Colin, I mean, and I can, from your presentation, your primary concern is obviously the employees uh, within the industri industry. Um, and again, this is back to this emergency <coughs> payment for employees, and it's about making it simple uh, and, and looking at um, shortcutting it. Um, the current system that we have in here is much too bulky, um, and so we have to do it differently, and it will probably have to be online uh, in relation to all of that yeah, as well. If I come in there, I think actually the best way to get this payment out is actually you know, it's going to take government time even to work out the system of payments. If we look at our, our colleagues down south who are doing the same, you know, you know get, give us the cover for the banks to give it. You know, the banks can give it to the employers. We already have all of the routes to pay our employees. Um, if we know the figures, if it's pro rata, we know, you know, if somebody works eight hours a week, they, it's pro rata, the figure is. The mechanism exists with us to do this. It only has to be a case of pumping it through the banks mm. and giving the banks the, the lead to go ahead as soon as it's decided. But I think it must be, this has to be a meaningful amount. It can't be just, oh, clear off on job seekers. Mm. Nobody could live in here in job seekers. I mean, our colleagues down south, okay, it says 203 euro. Our approach is that should be the minimum. And actually, we're working with the ICTU. You know, what, what it really is, it's about putting bread on people's table mm -hmm. today. The only issue with that is £203 is the minimum in the Irish Republic. The minimum here is significantly less. Absolutely. So are you going to lift everybody to that level? That's going to be the issue. Yeah. Yeah. And you also have to have a way of actually doing it really quickly. I think Colin's right. You put it through the employers um, and there is very fast ways of doing it. I mean, a number of people are letting people go today so they can pay them two weeks' notice so they can give them a cushion because it normally takes about six weeks to get your payment. Universal Credit is paid monthly, I believe. Uh, Job Seekers Alliance is paid on a fortnightly basis. It takes and six weeks to get it. And six <laughs> weeks to get it. One thing I will say is, and this is something maybe that everybody needs to be acquainted with, there are a number of things that are done at a national level, sickness pay being one, um, HMRC, AYE being done by the Treasury. So that we need to be very clear on what is from here, and I think that is one of the points at the start. I think the word stimulus, it's the right sentiment, but the wrong word. That there may be additional support required for Northern Ireland in terms of a survival package. <coughs> and that should sit outside what the Treasury is currently offering. Um, but that's just, you know, from our point of view, Colin is correct. There is a way of paying it out and paying it out very quickly. Some people will have to be kept on and payment and um, paid, and hotels are going to have to go in as are lots of other hospitality industries, they're going to have to into the red to continue to pay them. Otherwise, their buildings are going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gordon? Thanks, Chair. As I get, we, you know, we genuinely um, feel for you, all of you, and you know, I think we, a lot has been said, and uh, you know, we, we all recognise the great effort that's been done by the tourism sector in recent years, and the hospitality sector, and the positivity there's been We've already had it, the uh, presentations we've had some months ago, and it's just, it is really, really tough to see what has happened so quickly. And in all our constituencies, we're, we're very much aware of it, and the people are knocking on our doors and talking to us and excited about it, and you can see the effect of in our, our town centres. And, and, you know, we think we'll, we appreciate what you're saying directly to us today. We're going, you know, obviously we'll be lobbying our ministers and talking to them directly later on later on today about, about the needs. But um, I suppose it, it, the difficulty is, is getting something uh, something that fits all. There are a lot of people out there in similar circumstances, and any system we have needs to, to recognise that. And we have to be, be equal in what we do. Uh, just a couple of points on um, the fat deferment. 
Is, is that significant, or is it something that's going to be put off for? I think there's two yeah, elements. Taking it down the, the can down the road, just. Yeah, I mean, there's two. I mean, obviously, there is a, an emergency helpline for people who can ring with regards to any VAT payments that are that are due, um, and that they will be deferred. And I've also heard that has been happening for PAYE and NIC payments as well for employers. But it's up to the employers to make the call to talk about their individual case. What we've called for on the UK government, so we are part of the UK Tourism Industry Emergency Response Group and part of the UK Tourism Industry Council, um, is that we need to remove the processes around this, that it's it's taken as automatic, that you that you do not need to, to pay your VAT. Um, so so that that is it is it is there and it's implemented mm. now. The other problem you've got is these are, I suppose, costs that to be honest, businesses probably wouldn't have been paying anyway. You know, in the situation mm. that they're in, there are going to be certain, you know, as, as everybody has said, the staff is the most important cost. Mm. But what it does is it takes I suppose you know for those if we can we can see that they can keep going for a while it's one less thing they need to worry about and i think mental health is another big thing you know these are people who have built these businesses and are desperate with regards to the impact it's having on their staff so i think the, the removal of any of that so you don't even need to to worry about that is important but there are also some tourism sectors for example in the in the coach company and the coach operators where it's zero rated They've been investing in new coaches. We expected a really good season this year. I know of one company invested in three new coaches. You have to pay the VAT up front on that and then wait for HMRC to refund it. So in this particular case where you've got their paying salaries of 40,000 um, a month, um, they already paid 33,000 last month. They're due to pay another 43,000 this month on VAT to the supplier and they will not get that money back until mid-May or the end of May from HMRC. So again, we have asked directly um, into you UK government, how do you speed that up or how do you remove the need? Uh, or Because it, it, they're actually paying suppliers, which is really important. So how do we get HMRC to pay that immediately um, and, and not have people waiting where that's eating into vital cash flow to pay staff? Okay, Graham. Gordon, I may come in there. You're saying about yes. things. I mean, I think the VAT thing is it'll solve itself because if we're not earning anything, we're not paying VAT. Uh, I think the big thing is we've seen you know, deferments of mortgage. We need to see deferment of rent. Uh, both for domestic, for people that work with us, and also industry. And we need government to put pressure on landlords to do that. Uh, and it, you know, it, it's utility bills. We also need to see frozen. I mean, anything that needs money, we will not have it. So it's freezes it, put us in the deep freeze, and hold us there, and feed our staff, and then you know, hold the clock where we are, and we will come out the other end with the same debt. And hopefully the staff will be able to work for us. I think the other important factor has been mentioned, you know, is the, the negative impact there will be that people are not out in hotels and, and, and so on, restaurants and pubs socialising. You know, I do dread this thing that people are going to sit at home. My mum was, was a health visitor and she used to always say that people sitting at home, they got on each other's nerves. You know, and it, it is, there is something about it. Yeah. And people are going to be sitting at home, and it does. I think this, the whole impact. And they're sitting at the minute absorbing social media, which mm. it's a good and a bad thing, you know. And, and the fact that people are not getting out and, and, and are going to be isolated and families isolated, and when the schools do eventually close, the impact of this is very, very significant. And you know, the other thing, keeping you in, in the deep freeze and ready to fire up whenever things start to to move, which, God willing, there will only be a few months, and, you know, uh, I think it's important that your businesses will be there and people will get back out and mix and socialise because it is so important, it's so important and more important than ever with the social media world that we're living in, where people are, are in many ways isolated on a number of issues. I, th I think this is also comes back to your point earlier, Claire, you know, about information being provided. As I said, you know, with the social distancing, you can't, you know, we've talked about parks and, and, um, and different outdoor venues that are open yeah, yeah. and taking the right precautions with your, with your distancing, etc. People can still go out and, and enjoy that. And I think that will be important. We're moving into hopefully the warmer season. Um, I know Visit Britain are doing some virtual reality stuff, you know, so that people might not be able to <coughs> hear, but they can still have a look at what's going on. So, I, but I think we're, this is us all coming together and, and how we do support everybody. But I think there are ways that people can get out and, mm. 
mm. and enjoy some of the experiences that we Which have. Which we'd be encouraged. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. A couple you. of things you need to think of too on an island basis. At the moment, a lot of hotels and restaurants along the border are getting considerable flack from both customers and staff and on social media at the fact that they are still open. Um, many of them can't close. Secondly, in relation to insurance, um, most people's policies will include a particular um, statement and once something has been described as a pandemic, their insurance becomes null and void. A number of diseases are listed. You'd be pleased to hear these cover cholera, <coughs> diphtheria and the plague, but not coronavirus. So their insurance is automatically um, null and void. And I suppose the last thing for us, we do hope to come back. And I hope that when we do that, um, we will be able to sit here with John McGrill and then that there will be no argument among the amount of money that this industry will need to kickstart it. As a hotel sector, we've spent £600 million in the last year. If we were to get a figure of 1% of that, which would be £6 million when we come back, it would be a considerable help to us restarting our business after a period of significant depression, both physical and economical. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, Thanks, Chair. Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everybody. Um, I totally get this. I think we all do. My sister worked for Flybe until two weeks ago and lost her job. Um, my brother-in-law owns a restaurant and is standing down the barrel looking at what's going on in Belfast. He just can't open his doors. My family opened a new shop in Carrick three weeks ago and they don't know if they'll make it till next month. Um, my sister works in a pub. My, you know, family members here in the industry, tourism are contacting me every day. Our phones haven't stopped from hotelers, from guest house owners, from pub landlords, from everybody. We're on the precipice of the worst, as I said earlier on, potential economic crisis in history, and you need support now. Um, and we need to provide that. There's no doubt. Well, we need to look at every possible mechanism for that. Um, a couple of things I wanted to raise in terms of insurance. Some. Um, businesses are common to me saying they want direct decisions being made because their insurance will pay out. I'm interested to hear, Jim, as you say, that that's not the case for some of your members. We Other pubs I'm hearing say that as soon as they're told to shut, they will get that. Do you need that clarity? Or Some will. Some will, some will need it. Some. But if there is a directive for business interruption yeah. and they are told to close, they may get certain elements of it. Okay. But for some people, it will actually be written in that it is for specific diseases uh -huh. and also be written in once something reads a pandemic stage, that actually is classified in a different manner. The, so, sorry, go on. Okay, I was going to say, the, um, as, far, as far as my understanding is, the Secretary of State has the power under civil disturbance order 20 of 2004, I think it is, to close everything. The problem is, for some it will give them a payout and others it will actually kill it. There is no, it's yeah. not going to actually solve the problem. You'll hurt as many as you help. Yeah, mm. and we'll only be getting the word from the ones who it's going to help, ah. to the ones who yeah. want to send, please. So I suppose people are being told, though, not to come to your industry. So, but you obviously you still want them to. Well, I'm socially isolating, or well, socially distancing, and, and Prime Minister specifically addressed that yesterday and said that what they, because the problem was they had, they had said avoid social venues but had not said to close. So um, the, the Prime Minister, and I obviously needs to be checked, but he confirmed yesterday that the advice that they had given would um, allow the insurance clauses to kick in. So that's but well, how that comes down on the ground, but that's certainly what he said yesterday. I, I, think, I think that's a bit it's optimistic from what I said. I spoke to some of our insurance this morning. Uh, I think, look, I mean, and, and I get there's all sorts of different opinions about should we shut, should we be open, what are we doing? And I'm getting calls, I mean, I'm fairly accessible, I'm getting calls from staff going, you know, can you tell my boss to stay open because I need paid? And, you know, we're in, we're in that. I mean, and to be honest, I'm getting calls. I've had school teachers, butchers, the bakers, everybody ringing us going, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, we do need government leadership. Really, we need it. I mean, this is our war, uh, and we need a unity government. Um, you talked about um, the immediate action and some of the things you want to see step in. Is there anything, in terms of the bills that are imminent, I know I said to my family, they've got bills that are coming in that they just can't afford to pay in terms of the businesses. I said, look, if it's your rates, just don't pay it. If it's your, if it's your, I mean, we need we need big companies to come in, the the utility agencies to say, look, you're not going to be pursued if you can't afford to pay your bills. While we're waiting for legislative process to kick in, Businesses need to know now that they're not going to be pursued for not paying what they can't pay. The same that goes for families, because they can't be forced into bankruptcy or in the destitution just because of something that was not their fault. Oh, absolutely. And that's why um, we are all calling. We need to see 
collective responsibility and leadership from the executive. We need them to step up and say this is, you know, and, and you know, we, we've heard our Prime Minister speak in the UK, we've heard the Irish um, Taoiseach um, speak as well, and we need to have confidence that our executive are doing um, everything that, that needs to be done, both from a public health perspective, but also supporting people through this. Um, and, you know, we know that additional money has been allocated um, to, the, to the executive, and, it, and it's about that leadership and showing the measures that are going to make a difference now um, and give reassurance to people. People just need that reassurance. We have different messages coming out across um, the region from councils, from, from, from different ministers, um, and, and that just needs to come together so that we have we have a, a collective approach <coughs> and people are reassured. I totally agree. Claire touched on it. I mean, we don't have, as MLAs, we're trying to chase, we're chasing our tails, trying to get the information because even since we've been sat here, I've been 40 messages from different companies and, and self-employed people trying to get some direction on last night's announcement, what we're doing about it as an assembly of the this executive. Is, but that's like, that is the issue Exactly. And we need one, one serious, dedicated point of contact have, for everybody. You have the Chancellor who's on making things mm -hmm. that people assume are for all elements of this community. Mm. And that's not, in fact, the case. And it no. is really confusing when our finance minister comes on afterwards and says something that is totally different. I mean, SSP was guaranteed last week from the first day of sickness that it would be paid through. There is still no mechanism to get that money. It's actually not in place. Um, and I understand that it is also available to people who are self-isolating. I understand that it covers both. But there's no actual mechanism yeah for you to get that money from day one. And it's those very practical things that can be done. And they're not at a devolved level. They're actually at a you know a treasury Cash level. Yeah. And the treasury need to come out. I mean, most businesses, most large businesses in the UK will be paying, if they're lucky enough to have made a profit, they will be paying corporation tax this month. Um, we have advised our members, if they are paying it, just not to pay it. Mm -hmm. um, we've told them not to pay out any, run their business on a pure cash basis so that they can pay staff. Their two things are keeping staff and suppliers together, you know, that they can pay their suppliers for bringing things in this week and they can pay their staff. And one quick thing on the VAT, for example, if hotels are used to be hospitals, they will be paying VAT on that service that they provide, which is one thing that somebody actually needs to think about. So if you provide a hotel service, you will be paying VAT on it. So somebody needs to perhaps approach the Department of Health to see if the use of your hotel has changed, mm -hmm. can you actually put that in as a non vatable service? Um, most people will have paid a significant VAT bill for Christmas trading. Unless you pay your VAT monthly, you can make the choice of what way you pay it. But our advice to people is those monies, try and convert your cash, hold on to it, pay your people and look after them in the first instance. Just if I could go back for 10 seconds. Um, John's already said through the rule book out the window that we are in unprecedented times, and I fully agree with that. We need to come up with every possible solution. But you mentioned about not telling your members not to pay things. We need all of the statutory agencies and every utility to say nobody will be pursued or hounded through the courts if they cannot pay their water bill or their electric bill or their or their tax bill, because it's it's the difference between them not being there six months or a year later. So it's penny wise and pound foolish to change chase them now. If in six months or a year's time there are no businesses left to chase yeah. for anything, I mean, madness. Could, yes. I mean, could I mean our water, use on it. Yeah. A big chunk of the infrastructure and a big chunk of the electricity bill, use on it. Mm -hmm. Call it today. Yeah. Same yeah. as the rates process. But you're in a lucky position. We have a big rule book, which is the treasury, mm -hmm. which you can influence. <coughs> we also have a local rule book, <coughs> which you can move towards. You can actually instruct for additional stimulus and you can also take the mm -hmm. £600 million pounds that the Chancellor has given to support aspects of business further. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in that lucky position. All people are hearing is the top line figure and they are assuming it automatically appeals to, or applies to them and in many cases it doesn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is where this is becoming really confusing. You know, it's a bit like a war council. I mean, during the war everybody knew what was happening. You knew what your ration book was. This is a very similar situation. Unfortunately now, we have multiple media channels which seem to produce news both false and real, mm -hmm. and possibly somewhere in between. Um, but we need to have a really clear message 
I mean, the Assembly could come up with fantastic um, rulings for us very, very quickly okay. and be able to get them out, and that's what you need to do. Yeah. The Treasury can support us in other things on a national basis, but you have actually money which you can come out and actually pump out today in terms of, you know, well-being, in terms, I mean, we have a post office system, we have a job centre system, we have a lot of systems here that could be deployed in a manner that works very well. All the supermarkets are going to stay open. They're going to have to do shopping on a more measured basis. But information could be given out there. We've post offices, many of them now, in retail outlets. Mm -hmm. And there are methodologies that you could use. But as an assembly, you have additional powers. Mm -hmm. And we would urge you to use them and complement what the Chancellor has given us, as well as producing and understanding exactly what the Chancellor is promising and making sure that we have the money to cover it. Thank you. John? Um, I think you should be extremely naive in terms of the powers the Assembly and the Executive have. Yes, there's things we can and should be doing, but the, the Executive uh, doesn't have power over the Treasury. That's simply not doesn't. That's not what I said. But let me finish my point. Uh, we can speak to the Treasury, yes, but the rule book I'm talking about ripping up is how the world economy works. John quite rightly calls for... Uh, our column right, right, quite rightly calls for a freeze, the freeze in time. And I agree with you. I agree with you that the, the, the sectors shouldn't be paying their tax bills or any other bills. I agree with you that they shouldn't be contribution to insurance and all those sorts of things. But this is the harsh reality. And this is why we have to rip up the rule book. To see if the, 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 the central government isn't collecting the taxes. There's no money to pay for health. There's no money to pay for all the the extra resources we need to pump into the health service. There is no money to give to uh, workers, uh, whether it's through benefits or through government paying them wages, etc. Et so we, we have to understand the restraints and the constraints national governments work under and the executives working under. Because there has to be reality in the situation. So I do, and that's why I'm saying we need to rip up the rule book or at least put it in the drawer for three months to get through this crisis. But the first primary objective of the executive and the national government has to be restrict the spread of coronavirus, restrict the number of deaths. And underlying that plan is to have a, an economy on the other side of it, which the economy will recover, whether it's in two, five, ten years' time, it will recover. And there will be economic casualties throughout that time. There's going to be. Uh, but my, my, my primary objective, and I think our primary objective, has to be restrict the spread, restrict the life that are lost, and work with yourselves in a, in, a, in a sensible, open, transparent way, which can be delivered from both our sides. Because there's no point in me sitting here saying to you, giving you tea and sympathy around initiatives, when I know those initiatives can't be delivered under the current rules. So, yes, there's money coming into the executive. We need to get it out the door as quickly as possible. I agree that we should be able to get money out to keep staff on your books. But then, if those staff could be used in the health sector, or those staff could be used, as I've seen contributions in terms of how we use coaches, how we use other uh, catering staff, etc., if they can be used somewhere else in an emergency, we need to be using them somewhere else in an emergency. So, <coughs> folks, it's time for a wee bit of straight talking between us and solutions as well. John, I mean, you're saying what we're saying, maybe in different mm -hmm. words. Yeah. I mean, I have been in contact. I, I actually spoke to David Sterling yesterday morning by phone. I had been speaking to First and Deputy on utilising our staff. We actually brought a, a, an online platform and went here. You know, there's a, a, one of our organisations has a huge one. The weather could cope with the rush. We've set up our own helplines. I mean, I, I agree. This is not about. I mean, this is not. Well, we need to pay taxes to get out. If we were sending tanks off to war, we'd keep building tanks. Mm -hmm. So it's turn it the other way. If we have to go into as a nation, go into debt and borrow. You know, France has said. You know, nobody's going to go bust. I think no one should lose out, and no company should go bust. You know, this is. You know, and I get. I, I spoke. I said at length again. Don't our co companies will go bust. Well, there's no, no point in saying that companies well, will go bust. I mean, 
I think there's a principle to be had yeah. and then there's the, yeah. the outworking of it. As I say, I spoke to Finance Minister this morning, I think Finance Minister gets it. Uh, and I'm really realistic of what's in his gift. I mean, I welcomed the, th the, the three-month rate holiday, um, but what we're saying is Westminster needs to step up and do more. Everything that comes from Westminster for that needs to be passed through really quickly. And, and I think the financier needs, when he goes to the exec committee, the support of the other measures. If he's listening to what we're saying and wants to do it, give him the support from the other parties to do it, to make this happen and happen fast. We know the economy minister has written to her executive colleagues with regards to um, sort of the package and, and what the sort of aid um, is, and I know that's being discussed today. Um, I think it, it is about. Um, we all recognise that this is a world that we have not seen before um, and we are all going to have to do things differently. Um, I think it's you're looking for that, you're looking for that real leadership with regards to how we are managing this um, as a region, as part of um, the island of Ireland and as part of the UK. Um, and I think what you've heard from everybody is we are, everybody wants to play their part. Um, but it, it is about it, it's about the speed of of trying to get information out to uh, to businesses, and I think what we are saying is there is an immediate need now within the tourism, hospitality, and accommodation um, sectors. A few things just with regards to feeding into the UK, which I know, and, and uh, obviously that we're uh, the ministers and and officials are working closely with, um, with the Irish government as well. Obviously, Cobra has um, now implemented the Economy and Business Committee, which is chaired by the Chancellor. Um, and vice chaired by uh, the business secretary. Now, it is vital that our finance minister is on that, and I think we need to be pushing for that. Obviously, we know our first deputy and uh, minister and health minister are in the COBRA calls, um, but they've now, so there's ones that are specifically looking at healthcare, public services, international, and the economy and business. And those are the channels we use. We're using our channels um, into, uh, into the UK as well um, to ensure that the devolved nations, and that's why the, the Chancellor specifically actually put out how much was given to the devolved nations, which was to support that 20 billion that he had announced for, for, for GB. Um, but it's, you know, we all need to be making sure that we get that, that message in through all of the channels that we have. Thank you. I think that we are as equally concerned as you about the health, and that's the number one thing for yeah. us. So we want our employees, if they are still employed by us, to feel secure that they can stay at home for 14 days instead of people turning up for work because they're afraid they won't be paid. And that's a very mean <coughs> restaurant. I mean, we've people who've set up restaurants that sold 200 and 300 people, set them up to hold 70. And that is a very important thing for us. Our number one aim is to get most of our staff out this far side of this in the same health as they went in, both mental and physical. And I think that that is very important. My point to you in relation to Treasury will support certain things at a national level. I believe as an Assembly you can give additional support to the citizens of this region. And that's the actual um, system that we are talking about. You may get additional funding that you can use specifically for us, and there may be specific things that can be done to help our sector and in turn the and in turn the wider economy. And I think therein lies your own special power. In terms of what specifically would you like us to see us do with the next very 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 short period of time? I'd like you to explain what the Chancellor is looking after and what you're looking after. I'd like you to work out how people here are going to get job benefit quickly, um, and that's anybody who is either has been laid off or otherwise. And I'd like you to really cover the sick pay thing and put pressure on the Treasury to get that sick pay solution sorted out. The Chancellor, the Business Secretary, was on the news this morning saying that small business loans will be given out through uh, local, gov local government. Um, is that going to happen here if people want or feel that they can apply for them? So if you could actually do a one-page thing of this is what's been handled centrally and this is what's been handled um, by the Treasury, then that will make everybody's life. And we can all as agencies <coughs> and as different organisations carry that and send it out. And we have no doubt that as this situation evolves and people get sick, our staff will be you know, moving like flights of people around. You may have 300 people in the hotel sector one day who might move to the... Um, care sector the next day and then they may in turn move along. 
So that's what we would like you to do to say, you know, what has been handled centrally. And also, it is really confusing at night when the con Chancellor comes on television, the Prime Minister, and they say things that bear no relevance to here. And somebody needs to be on the news here at half six afterwards saying, this doesn't apply to Northern Ireland, or this will be answered answer centrally, or our policy in relation to this. I mean, people are probably phoning Belfast City Council today asking, can they get a £25,000 grant? Thank you. Um, Claire? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't think you're naive at all. I think what you're trying to do is encourage leadership. I think you're trying to um, exhaust the powers that the Northern Ireland Assembly, the Northern Ireland Executive have. Of course, that has to happen within context, and we have to consider the constraints and, and uh, challenges that that will present. But um, by all means, I, I, I don't think you are naive. I think this is uh, we have to be looking at every option every new opportunity we have to be innovative in how we how we do things um, you know so for example even in terms of the banks you know are our banks going to continue to pursue repossessions you know we're responsible for the insolvency service here in Northern Ireland are there opportunities through the Department of Justice to, to try and limit that happening alongside speaking with the banks so that people aren't receiving intention to enforce or enforcement notices within itself so um, you know so I, every department will have to play its role. I think there's every opportunity to do that. Um, insofar as we are responsible for, for certain pieces of the remit, then we can legislate or we can we can do various different things. So I, I, I don't think what you're saying is unreasonable. I, I think what you're essentially trying to do is get this place to actually understand what its role is and do it. Um, I suppose what some of the concerns, and you had mentioned the banks, Colin, you've been chatting with them. Um, I'd be quite keen to hear some of the conversations around that, because I know the Minister for the Economy herself has had been those conversations. But again, we're seeing in other parts of the UK where mortgages are going to be frozen. Um, and again, I don't even think it's for everyone. I think it's for those who will be most affected. What does that even mean? You know, so um, in terms of your conversations with the bank, I suppose, from a business perspective. I mean, I think you, mean, you have to take across the economy, there will be different impacts on this. You know, it, if, if you run something where we can take their laptop home and work, yeah. there is some degree of income and business going on, albeit it's never going to be the same. Our sector is obviously, you know, we, we, we're on the, the, the coal face. We're going over the, you know, we're kind of the, 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 the trenches. Um, so I have had conversations with the banks. I have some more today. I'm speaking to the head of all the banks. Um, there it is about, you know, and, and it is about, look, I mean, if, if people don't need help, then they don't need help. You know, this is about what we need to make sure that people that need help get it, they get their mortgages deferred, that they are working with them about, you know, how can they pay this or that. You know, it, it's, it's come into partnership is what we're saying to the banks. It's also about resilience of their systems. Um, they need to ensure that, you know, if you know, there are, is some trade going on, if there is some people, you know, doing deliveries and stuff, that people can get money at the hole in the wall to pay for it, that... You know, if, if for some reason branches start because of people getting ill, and I don't want to get sensational, but you know, mm -hmm. you know, but you know, do we all the banks come together to have one branch operational in that area so there is access for people to get to? There's a, a myriad of stuff there, but really the banks too, you know, and and it is important the banks know. On the other side of this, if we all work together, you know, there is a really good future for our hospital and tourism industry, and it's making sure the banks know that and hold the faith with us through this uh, and work with people and say we're we have a, we've already got I heard the department say about advice we've already got a, a, a legal hotline up and stuff advising our people and all sorts of stuff and that shows when you go to the banks and say okay I've thought it through I've got the scenarios I've got my house in order and the banks then work with them. Mm -hmm. The banks have indicated when we've spoken to them that they are happy to work with business they will look for certain stress tests um, but they will also look to government in terms of their own liquidity. There are very strict rules in relation to capital, capital and deposit ratios now, and the bank may look for some changes to those. But most banks have said to people that they are expecting them to come to them with a three-month scenario and a six-month scenario. The six-month scenario might be around payment holidays um, and things like that, and then the three- to six-month period might be around the provision of working capital. But our advice to members has been to actually have a look through that. The banks. 
the banks have actually been relatively proactive. I think with the recognition that they perhaps were bailed out previously and now is the time for them to kind of pay back. Um, and also in reality, if you're going to liquidate and put a whole industry into receivership, nobody is going to win. Yeah. And I think the Bank, the bank of England um, you know, have made sure that the banks have that liquidity and capability. We are working with the Hotel Federation with regards to how do we get that practical guidance for, for businesses in engaging with the banks. I mean, I think all of us are, are engaging with the banks and ensuring um, that we're getting those messages of reassurance and support for business, which I have to, have to say is coming from across um, the banking sector. There's more information they need with regards to some of the schemes that have been announced on a, on a UK level. Um, and um, But that, you know, but I think everybody is engaging and the banks are giving the right messages, um, certainly at the moment. Okay, and, and a quick question around sole traders and self-employment. Um, I know over the last number of years with other um, achievements around tourism, a lot of sole traders and self-employed people have emerged, particularly with those in relation to food tourism and, and, and that type of thing. Are you hearing anything from those um, individuals about accessing <coughs> excuse me, um, potential benefits? Because I'm hearing that if you if you turn up to jobs and benefits office and you're registered as a sole trader or, or self-employed, it's much more difficult to access welfare-related benefits. Exactly. Yeah. And the, the thing was, obviously, because we, we'd have a lot of tour guides, for example, yeah, we yeah. are... We are self-employed, um, and um, you know that they so they become unemployed. They have to go through the process of, of signing on, um, and this is something we've been talking about earlier on. Is that um, employment support for just not staff, but actually self-employed people? The uh, the um, announcement to date from the chancellor was about SSP. So if, mm -hmm. as a self-employed person, you had to self-isolate, you could claim SSP from or statutory sick pay from day one. Mm -hmm. um, we're still waiting to hear on the the wider, you know, the benefits. Because in the, in relation to that, they they removed the limit for universal credit. You know, so there were some things done. Um, when it comes to unemployment, that's what we're waiting for. I think that's what the chancellor was referring to in the next couple of days. That that's what they're working through. But no, and, and you know, we we've so we've got people who are signing on that are being told they have to wait. Yeah. to get, you know, through the normal yeah. processes to get that benefit. And that's definitely something that needs to be addressed. Um, Chair, I will reiterate the point around communications. And you know, I'm just looking at the, the various websites in front of me. The Northern Ireland Direct website, which is the website for the general public, um, insofar as uh, COVID-19 talks about it as a public health um, uh, issue, it's not talking about it in any other circumstance. It's not talking about it in terms of benefits. And to be able to access the information in relation to benefits or the, or the economy, you have to go to a different website the Department for Communities has updated in relation to access to benefits. So I think now people don't have to present themselves at a JBO. They can do it online. But they can do it online. Yep. You still have the um, you still have the waiting time. Yeah, yeah, but but it's it's that conflicting information. And I know if I was a member of the public, and I haven't been, I suppose now for over six years, I'm a public servant. Um, I, I wouldn't know where to go. I wouldn't know what the information is. I'm, you know, my staff are, are sending me through some information. And I'm asking them, is that UK Gov or is that Northern Ireland? Because I don't want to, you know, state this publicly and it not be confirmed here. You know, we, we really do need a significant communications plan um, for for Northern Ireland in respect to this issue, and it's it's not happening. Thank you. So can I just clarify one point? Yes. Um, do you mean you say, talk about uh, the waiting time? Is that the waiting time for qualification or the waiting time for payment? For pay? Well, I, oh, well, I, oh, I'd have to check, John. I just know there's a waiting there's a, there's a, there's a lag. Yeah. But you may, it, it varies from case to case, but it is generally an average of about six weeks. Okay. Need. Uh, I just want to come back in and finally say, um, you know, if there was ever a time for a joined up government, it is now. Yeah. And I want to thank you uh, for your leadership. Here and there is a perception in the public that we haven't shown the same. You haven't got that reciprocated uh, from this assembly and from our executive. And once again, I find myself in the position of saying, I am sorry. We are sorry. We seem to be behind. This is a crisis, and I know people are reacting um, on their feet. But there are things that we can do, and I would agree with Claire. You know, we do have a responsibility, and we can react. Uh, and I hope going forward that we will be doing that. Um, this is not just a business problem. I know we're in the economic committee and we're talking in, in business terms, but this is a household problem. Mm -hmm. This is a domestic problem. Uh, it's not about just freezing the rents for businesses. Um, it's freezing the rents 
or homeowners or, or, or people that are leasing it and mortgages. We're talking about this in a holistic. This is a human problem. This is a human problem mm -hmm. uh, and it goes across. I just wouldn't like the perception to be there that, you know, that there's kind of self-interest of businesses. Businesses are not being self-interested uh, in this at all. This is a human cost uh, and we've got to react to it in that way. Uh, and I think we've got to be realistic um, in, in doing that. Um, there is things that we can do. We will not be able to do everything, um, and we will be looking for the UK government to step up. But you know, there are good examples of where leadership has been shown, and it has been on this island. Uh, uh, and, and by the Taoiseach last night, we haven't seen that within the Northern Ireland Executive, and we haven't seen it within the UK. And shame on us. But hopefully. We'll, we'll move forward and we're, we're moving today as we speak. All of the departments are having an emergency meeting um, collectively uh, with the executive to, to bring forward plans. So um, bear with us. I know we're slow, but hopefully we will get to the position that you need us to get yeah, to I guess and that we need to get to as well. Maybe comment on that. Look, this isn't about business. You mean Nor Northern Ireland is not like GB. We don't have big multinational chains of you know 900 <coughs> premises, or whatever. I mean, the people that run the businesses with us, their staff that work for them, or their you know, they're their virtual family. Mm -hmm. You know, they mm -hmm. go to their weddings, they go to their christenings, and unfortunately, they're going to end up going to some of their, the funerals. You know, if, if I take Bill Mosley, and, and, and I maybe shouldn't sing about, I mean, one of our biggest operators, probably one of our best employers for staff. Bill will know every one of them by name. He'll know their kids, their birthdays, all about them. That's the world we live in. I mean, I will say We're family. Yeah, people do business with yeah. people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't do business with, with companies. Yeah. And particularly in our businesses, even in the very big ones, as Colin's just mentioned, it is you are doing business with a person. And that's, you know, it's the human cost for this that is the thing that really makes a difference. Thank you very much for. I just make a point. Just um, I think you've done your, you know, you've done a very good job in, in directly relating to us all. And certainly, the feedback I'm getting is already. I believe our ministers are listening, and I believe there will be po a positive response in relation to a lot of the points that's been made. And uh, not everything, of course, will be delivered, but you make a good point. Um, it's about people. We are about people. We are elected by people, and we represent people, and we communicate with people on a daily basis through our constituency officers. Uh, and we care deeply about the people of Northern Ireland who have come through so much. And they are resilient, and they will come through this. And God willing, they'll, they'll fight back. They've, they come through a lot of trouble and tribulation. And you know, it's a great place. People like yourselves have done a lot in recent years, tourism and developing the hospitality sector. And uh, I believe, you know, there'll be good days through it, but I would just give you that assurance. I believe there will be something positive that's come out of it. Thanks, Chair. Can I, can I just make a quick point? Just to clarify, the three-day waiting period has been removed, but I think the more important point what you've made is this. We need to be paying people a living wage mm -hmm. so they can survive during this period. The three-day waiting period has been removed, but you actually, on t you actually don't have a mechanism of getting the money from day one. That it may be up in principle now, mm. but certainly last week people were not being paid from the first day. Yeah, fair enough, so yeah. that, that is the difference. Yeah. Can I just 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 to finish off really was um this changes as you know on a on an hourly and daily um, basis. Um so more than happy to find a way of keeping the um uh, committee updated whether I'm sure, I don't know whether you're moving to conference calls or whatever way that's gonna happen. Um but obviously we're here and, and we're happy to provide that in, in whatever mechanism we can. Do you have a WhatsApp group? <laughs> we will do when we have phones that will support it. Uh, sadly, yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time Thank and you. for well, all the well, information well, you've well, shared. And thanks thanks to John and Donal as well. Mm -hmm. um, members, we are now moving to closed session. Yep. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.